Majority Report with Sam Cedar, where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday, Tuesday, casual Tuesday, Wednesday, casual hump day, Thursday, casual thurs, that's what we call it, and Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, October 29th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, the executive editor, the American prospect David Dayan will be joining us. And then, well, he's the executive editor, he's the founder of the Daily Poster. David Sirota will be joining us. Us fulfilling our requirement to have an all David show. Double David. Final Friday of October. Meanwhile, Build Back Better Framework and Draft Release. Now we know what's in the bill for the moment, sort of. U.S. prisoner captured in Pakistan in 2003 details his CIA torture in public for the first time ever. Meanwhile, by administration, considering paying up to $1 million dollars per immigrant family separated under the Trump family separation policy. Up to 12,000 Air Force personnel refuse vaccinations. However, over 96% have complied with the vaccine mandate. All this as New York City could see a city worker shortage as its vaccine mandate deadline is Monday. Speaking of New York, disgraced former Governor Andrew Cuomo charged in a sexual misconduct complaint. Illinois Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger will not be running in 2022. Democrats in Illinois have done a decent job in their redistricting. Political employees demand to unionize and the debt collective abolishes 3.2 million dollars in bail debt for over 20,000 debtors in Mississippi and Florida lastly Senator Richard Burr and his brother-in-law subjects of an insider trading investigation by the SEC nice to get that type of information and lastly, Facebook is now meta. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to just take a moment. Emma Vigeland here, is here, of course, and I want this also. This uh, is not, this is also for Emma as well. I have a, an apology to make. I have let down my my colleagues i have let down my family um i know there's probably for those of you who are aware of it at this point watching the show are aware of this and i apologize for letting you folks down as well i think it's um it's clear i am not wearing a collared shirt at all today and I know that people have come to expect this kind of, uh, th th that I would wear a collar shirt, although it's Friday, a soft collared shirt. I'm not wearing one. I'm wearing a long sleeve uh, t-shirt. And I, I don't know what I can do beyond saying I'm sorry. And I cannot promise that it won't happen again. What? There are times, I, I just, I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I'm, I'm human. 
And well, uh, I mean, you lied when you said that soft collared shirts would be on Friday. So you already lied. How do I trust that you're saying that you're not going to lie? Or how do I trust anything anymore? Well, I'm not sure that you can. So uh, guys, uh, just... uh, Sam's neck, everybody, though, folks. Yep. There you might go. be the last chance for a while. Yep. So sorry. I, I mean, you're going to have to work to regain our trust. I hope you understand that. Well, that's why I'm making no promises about my my collar status, because that way I'm managing expectations. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> here's Nancy Pelosi. Let's just start with this. I mean, I, I honestly I don't know what to say. Uh, Joe Biden went to uh, Europe. A... Um, he has uh, meetings with the G20, I believe it is, and then was heading to COP26, which is the uh, climate change summit in uh, in Glasgow. Um, he wanted to have a deal struck by then. Instead, there was the announcement of a framework for the reconciliation bill. There is some there are some specifics, and we're going to be talking with David Dane about those specifics in a moment. And then I imagine also with David Sirota, but, um, and the, the Democrats, Nancy Pelosi wants the progressives today to vote for the, um, for the bipartisan bill. And I don't think that's happening and good. Here is, uh, Nancy Pelosi trying to put, um, lipstick, on a, a pig, as it were. I mean, I don't know how piggy this is or how much lipstick this is, frankly, but uh, here it is. All three of these, health, planet, child care, et cetera, are all about the children. They're also about jobs, jobs, <laughs> jobs, jobs, how people access them, jobs that are created by the new green technologies, uh, jobs that are part of the national security of our country, that is necessitated by our protection of the environment. And so it is a, an initiative that, that uh, gives a big tax cut to the middle class, creates jobs, good paying jobs, lowers costs for families, and while making the wealthiest and big corporations pay their fair share. That's really the framework that the president shared with us this morning. And, it's, uh, it's remarkable. It's remarkable in that it's a big vision, bigger vision than we've seen in a very long time, maybe dating back to President Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, some, in some respects to Lyndon Johnson, who had a great agenda as well. But I remind, we always remind everyone that Franklin Roosevelt had 319 Democrats in the Congress at the time, and we have 220, and uh, that makes a big, that makes a big difference. Hmm. That was severe. Thank you for all those specifics. It's for the children, and it's for the jobs. I believe the children are our future, and that's why jobs. Well, I mean, nothing you just said was was incorrect. Um, I mean, they're going to try and uh, you know the the. Well, we'll talk to David Dane about the, you know, the, the what what's in the bill and what by what metrics we can measure the bill, but by their own by the own expectations that they set out, it has been a failure. There was a failure of leadership here, failure of understanding their own caucus, failure of strategy failure to understand that there was no interest and no value in spending any time talking to Republicans. Um, and so th this is, um, this, uh, this is a, uh, you know, well, I guess we will, we, we will see it's not over yet. So it's hard to say it is a, um, uh, you know, a, a failure per se, but here, let's just listen to, um, uh, Pelosi, uh, uh, further on that press conference. This is uh, clip number two. We had said for a long time now, if we had a framework that had our priorities spelled out clearly and agreed to, 
that added up to a top line, start with the priorities, and then added up to a top line, which was the limit. The priorities I mentioned, the top line, 1.75 approximately, and the commitment that we would have the same bill pass the House and the Senate. That's what we have now. That's what the President presented. And we won't have anything regardless of whatever input we have in the bill, unless it is agreed to by the Senate. And, of course, we have to have it comply with the Senate 51 vote rule of the Bird Rule and the, the two things, the Bird Rule and the Privilege Scrub. Is that more in the subject than you ever want to know? But anyway, that's what we have to do. And we hope to do that um, soon. But we, again, have <laughs> okay. to listen. The, word I mean, salad. Yeah. Word gobbledygook. I mean, the, the problem is that they thought they would have this resolved by now, and they clearly didn't. And, um, I, well, we will talk to uh, David Dayan and uh, get his perspective on, on what, maybe what pr uh, progressives should do. We will talk to David Sirota. Same thing. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will be talking to at least one of those Davids right after <laughs> this. Uh, today's program sponsored by Sunset Lake Sebede. Where's the sign? You know, <laughs> always forget the sign. No soft collared shirt today. I, I, no I, I sign. I, I can't. No I integrity. Always, no, I know it. I know it. This is the only thing right here. I would have to say, the the uh, the integrity is found in the actual product of the yes. Sabe Day. You can go to their website. You can see the third party analysis of what's in there. Good luck. Good luck with that um, that tincture that you got from the you know the the head shop down the street or wherever it was. Not right. happening. This uh, these <laughs> Those guys things are junk. These guys uh, do it right. Left is best. Gets you twenty percent off. Gets you twenty percent off the tincture. The tincture with melatonin. The um, the gummies. The coffee. The fudge. The hand lotion. The smokables. Matt, talk about the smalls. Uh, the smalls are a really great uh, little product because it's already sort of taken off from the stem, so it goes right in your grinder for easy uh, grindage. There you go. Um, uh, folks, you will not be disappointed. Check them out. They're a great um, uh, company. We've got something planned for so-called Black Friday. Um, we're going to these guys are movement partners. They're always interested in, in using their business, not only to help their employees to a $15 minimum wage. They have mostly employee owned, um, uh, company, but also, um, unions, uh, they've supported our Afghan refugee things, a great company and a great product. So check it out. Integrated pest management, organic, uh, fertilizer you cannot do better. Sunset Lake, Sebede.com. Left is best, gets you 20% off. Check it out now. They also make great gifts. Those tinctures make great gifts. I mean, the gummies do too, I guess. And the fudge. Yeah, and the, and the I, 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 uh, I gave, um, I gave my stepsister some of that solve, right? That's what you call it, the stuff yeah. for your skin. She had some scarring and she really appreciated it. There so, All right. I want to welcome back to the program the executive editor of the American Prospect, David Dan. Here he is, or we call him the the Big D. There, oh, there he is. There he is. What's up, David? Here with Emma Vigeland. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Big D. What's up, guys? <laughs> um, yeah, you're playing it pretty cool. I understand why. I want to read. Uh, I want to read something to you. It is written by you. Oh, good. It was written in the New York Times. I and I know what I I know what I wrote, Sam. I know you did. You don't need to read it to me. No, I know I don't need to read it to you, but I need to read it to others. Um, you asked the question: Should they, being the Democrats, try to address all of the issues they care about? This is with the constraints now that have been imposed upon them by President's Mansion and Cinema, with roughly half the funds required to do the job properly. Or should they choose what stays and what goes and focus on executing what remains? To me, the answer is clear. 
the me being you in this instance, to be successful not only in this legislation, but revitalizing Joe Biden's presidency and his party, Mr. Biden must enact permanent, simple, meaningful programs and connect them to his argument about how government can work again. For too many years, Congress has tried to resolve longstanding policy issues by erecting complicated systems that an untutored public must navigate. Ordinary people who qualify for benefits, usually because they're in great financial need, are drafted into becoming unpaid bureaucrats, forced to spend time and effort to access what the system owes them. It's confusing, it's exasperating, and it's sapped the faith that Americans once had in their government. Simply put, Democrats can't continue to campaign on solving big problems and then fail to deliver without destroying their political project and alienating voters. Um, I couldn't agree more with that last paragraph. I think that voters don't necessarily know the details, but they know the broad strokes over a period of time as to whether they're being uh, delivered, uh, you know, their promises are being delivered. Um, you set out a standard in which to assess what the end product becomes, even with that have the money. You've, you've read the bill, you're gonna tell us about it. Did they meet that standard? No. I mean, uh, they're David, about. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> thank you. I'll see you later. Um, th there are about two hundred programs in this bill. I, 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 I had the great misfortune of reading them all last night, and uh, it, it is exceedingly strange that you have this. I mean, in a, in a sense, it's not strange because you have one bill that is going to go, right? You have, you have this one bill that we know is going to get passed. Uh, it was initially given to all the House committees to uh, mock up, mark up. And uh, at that time, there was a $3.5 trillion budget. So, hey, all the stuff that we ever wanted to do, we can throw into this bill. Um, and they did. And then there came the reckoning from from the Mansion Cinematic Universe uh, <laughs> that um, that they had to cut the bill in half. So you would think that then they would narrow it to a few priorities that they could do very, very well. Uh, but that is not the case. Uh, if you go to the... Um, the uh, uh, Build Back Better framework that was put out by the White House uh, yesterday. It uh, includes a bunch of buckets for various items. And then it says 90 billion for equity and other measures. We all love equity. And, uh, uh, but what does that actually mean? Uh, it means nothing, actually, it turns out. Uh, uh, they're using the shield of the word equity to mask a bunch of pet projects that cost about $90 billion. And just to put this in context, if you spent $90 billion, you could get another year of the child tax credit. If you spent $90 billion, you might be able to get three or maybe even four years to make it permanent, the universal pre-K program. Uh, instead, they relied all their cuts on the main priorities of the program, <laughs> the main priorities, the things that, that are the top line things that everyone's going to hear about. That's what they cut. They did not touch $90 billion worth of other measures that no one's ever going to know about. Uh, and, and instead they, they, they you know, weakened the main parts of this bill. I, it, it makes absolutely no sense even if you agree with some of the other measures. And by the way, I do. I mean, there's a billion dollars to bulk up the antitrust agencies in this bill and 500 million to create a new Bureau of Privacy at the Federal Trade Commission. That's great. Uh, uh, you know, there's a couple billion dollars to protect the Pacific salmon and marine fisheries. I'm sure I'm, I'm a big marine guy. Why not? But there are other places where you could place that kind of, of, of money. There's the National Defense Authorization Act. That runs every year. You can make that, you know, these bills are called Christmas trees in uh, Congress because they have ornaments all over them. They get weighed down. Let me there just let me just other ornaments. 
that let me just have been passed. let me just clarify what you're saying here there are uh there are sort of smaller provisions that could and there's other spending bills that are going to happen or there are other must pass bills that are going to happen this year that you could stick into there so despite the fact that you know you you, you live and breathe the antitrust you'd like to see that uh that billion dollars right. put it on the uh the put it on the other must pass bill like free up this put bill it in you're the facing. appropriations bill where yeah. both you know there's a bipartisan agreement that the antitrust agencies need more money put it in there and and when you don't put it in a bill that it has an artificial spending cap created by Cinema and Mansion. Well, well, I mean, and and I want to we're going to go through the bill, but it, it really feels like from from Jump Street, as it were, that the, there was a massive failure of leadership by Schumer, by Pelosi, and by Biden. Like there there was in. in and it, and it comes in the form of what you're talking about here, marshalling, you know, the resources in the most effective way, saying no to people, saying to people or setting expectations for these um, for these committees. Chuck Schumer not telling anyone that Joe Manchin had already said one point five trillion six months ago or four months ago. Joe Biden inviting Republicans to come in and basically stretch out this process. None of them, by even their own sort of standards, if they had started out with a $1.75 trillion bill and said, we're going to do these three things, this would be a much better situation. Right. I agree. And But if you're going to criticize on that score, you have to also criticize progressives and the nonprofit sector uh, who decided every one of their little priorities had to get into the bill. And uh, frankly, uh, the the base of the party, who who raised all those expectations as well. Now you can say that those expectations were raised for them, but uh, there was a dynamic of we have the trifecta and we're going to get everything done in one bill, and that's just not realistic. It never was realistic. And uh, Jayapal had a decision point where she could have said. Let's just focus on our priorities. We have X amount of priorities. Let's just focus on them. And she didn't. She said, let's, let's get some stuff in, and it's going to be so great that, that no Congress in the future will ever uh, vote to take it away. And that I, I, just, I just think that is a tragic mistake. And uh, yeah. Well, because, I mean, if you're going to talk about this is the greatest achievement since FDR, which we played the clip of Pelosi saying that, like, there's not there's one thing that's structural in here and that's lasting, I would say. And that's the uh, universal pre-K that's for six years. And the rest of this, I mean, you talk about that. That's not lasting. Six and that's years not even it's not lasting. But compared I mean, to compared to the one year extension of the child tax credit, which is I, I mean, it's political suicide, if you really think about it a little bit harder. But I mean, the, in that 90 billion amalgamation of little pet projects, I saw in your piece today, three billion for Elon Musk like tunnels uh, which are BS projects uh, that are Cyber never going to. Yes. Yeah, what is it Hyperloop. called? Yeah, the the Hyperloop. Hyperloop. Oh, three billion for Hyperloop technology. Like, I mean, th there's no focus to this. And even from a political perspective, like if you want to talk about massive achievements, if you want to compare it to Medicare with LBJ, if you want to compare it to the New Deal, <laughs> which is laughable, you have to have social programs that are going to be resilient. And outside of maybe pre-K, <laughs> there's nothing. Well, there's one permanent thing in here, and it makes it's the thing that makes the child tax credit uh, permanently refundable. And uh, that is likely to reduce child poverty by about 20%. Okay. Uh, what it means by refundable is that uh, even if you have no tax liability, you still get it. So uh, that, that's a very important step. And that, that's the only permanent thing, really, that's in this bill. I mean, you could talk about the fact that, that when you reduce emissions, they are permanently reduced. So, I mean, you can talk about it in that sense. And, you know, I mean, whether, what you think about this bill is probably dependent on whether you think that the very large climate investment will work or not. Well, in um, concert with the, with the bipartisan package, which is climate net negative, 
I mean, I, I right. don't know I, what it does. <laughs> So I, I want to get into the details of this, but like you know, let's let's I guess since we're at like uh, fifteen twenty thousand feet, let's 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 stay there for a moment. Um, and we're also we should also say that we're just presuming, right, that the bill as you read last night through I followed your Twitter feed as you as you found different things. Uh, right. The bill as you read last night is actually going to get voted upon by 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 mansion and cinema and we're, we're assuming right um and we'll go through the details but what let me let me just ask you this and, and today my understanding is that, that pelosi was hoping to have a vote on the on the bipartisan bill was that right um well she was hoping for that last night and uh uh you know there was a full court press made including uh uh whip calls from the vice president uh but progressives weren't going to budge. I mean, Manchin and Cinema have not come out and affirmatively said, I'm endorsing this bill and I'm going to vote to pass it. And without at least that, there's no way that progressives can move forward. There's just not the kind of trust in uh, among both ends of the caucus to, to allow that to happen. So they're going to wait until uh, a, a bill is either voted on or, or there are clear on the record assurances from Manchin Cinema, they're going to vote for it. Is there any chance that progressives in 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 and, and, and to be honest, like I don't have a very clear sense of necessarily what's in the bipartisan bill. I have to say that, uh, but it seems to be more uh, meat and potatoes type of of things that um, so called uh, you know moderates want to bring home, uh, it, but you know, and more highway spending, as it were. But um, w is there a chance that the progressives could say, would say, would it make sense for them to say at one point, like, oh, yeah, and incidentally, we're not necessarily going to vote in favor of this bill even after we get them to sign on to the uh, reconciliation. I mean, is they're, that... They already gave up their leverage. Uh, they, they came out of their caucus meeting yesterday and said that there was overwhelming support for the bill framework in the caucus. Uh, uh, Jayapal said she's for it. Ilhan Omar said she's for it. Uh, it's done. I mean, it, we're just talking about dates here, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the one thing that might happen, I'm sure progressives would be happy to see this happen, but frontliners would be even happier to see it happen, is getting some sort of deal on something that could be called drug pricing reform. Um, Pelosi is working pretty feverishly on that right now. Uh, this is something that as far back as 2006, Democrats ran on. Uh, in, in some cases, it was the primary thing they ran on. Uh, the Intercept has a piece up today saying, uh, noting that in 2018, frontline members were told, uh, if you're asked about health care, talk about lowering drug prices by having Medicare negotiate with prescription drug companies. If they don't get this, they are I mean, they're dead in the water if they don't get this. A lot of these frontline members relied on on drug pricing reform as as their main accomplishment. They're going to be in big, big trouble if they don't get it. And so there is an effort underway to to try to make that happen. It's not going to be what uh, what was in the initial bill. It'll probably look something more like Scott Peters, who represents a district with a lot of pharma companies in it. Uh, which was uh, uh, negotiating prices, but only for drugs that are off patent, um, and a, a, which is ridiculous, and, and a couple other measures. Uh, however, even that weaker reform could yield up to $200 billion or more over a 10-year period, and that money cannot go to deficit spending. If they get that money... That has to be put towards making pre-K and childcare permanent. Uh, there's no other, there's no other responsible way to do this. Uh, uh, the, the nothing, nobody is asking for anything in those those measures to change, even though some things should. But you got to make them permanent. I mean, the, the 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 way that you fix bills in Washington is you get permanent bills, and then over time they get fixed. Social Security, Medicare. Uh, the ACA, in this bill, there's a fix on the subsidy levels. Uh, temporary bills do not get fixed because the fight on a temporary bill is whether to extend it. 
The right. fight is not on whether to change the policy. And so if we don't make some of these things permanent, what you see is what you get and what you see is not good enough. I, I want to just make also clear what, what, what you're saying there is that you can you can set up a program that you know has flaws, that you know is underfunded in certain areas, but if you make it permanent, the next step is to fix those things as opposed to coming up with something that you think is arguably perfect but only lasts 18 months and then it just goes away. Um, and we should say, I mean, this is the thing that is sort of like almost beyond mind blowing. When we talk about negotiating for uh, pharmaceuticals through Medicare, we are not talking about the expenditure of a single dollar. <laughs> we are talking about just simply the idea of allowing the government to do what every single other purchaser of any other product, particularly bulk product, does in our system, and that is simply allow them to negotiate and to knock down prices, obviously not just for uh, for Medicare, because Medicare is paying for it less, but presumably that would mean maybe less co-pays uh, for, uh, for, for, for drug recipients. I mean, this should be, it should be the most obvious thing in the world to be able to do, and, and, but of course- and, and to be clear, it's not just Medicare, to be clear, it's not just Medicare. It, these, these rates would be accessible to private insurers. So, and what that means is that, that everybody would benefit from them, not just Medicare recipients. Um, and there's another part of that bill that everyone seems to agree on, but it can't go forward without the drug price negotiation piece going forward that just says that drug companies cannot increase the price of their product by more than the rate of inflation. So, I mean, this is something that just says you're you're allowed to raise prices every single year, just not more than uh, the cost of living, and and they can't get that done. Whose failure is it that we don't that the name of the people, the names of the people who are literally who are specifically stopping this are just not household names? I mean, and and, and obviously well, they should be because their names. Well, that's are my Scott point. But who's Kurt Schrader of Oregon, uh, uh, Kathleen Rice of New York, uh, who might run for attorney general, by the way, for those New Yorkers out there, uh, Josh Gottheimer, and in the Senate, Bob Menendez, uh, and Tom Carper as well of Delaware. Uh, the, the, the common thread linking most of these folks is that they reside in districts or states with heavy concentrations of pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. New Jersey, Delaware, uh, that uh, Peter's district in San Diego area that has a lot of life sciences companies. Um, so they should be household names. And, and, and actually one big problem in this, you'll notice I didn't mention the name Kirsten Cinema. Kirsten Cinema, we kind of don't know. There's kind of a whisper down the lane kind of uh, way in which we believe that maybe she opposes some of this drug price stuff. But what is very, very clear is that all the folks that I just mentioned are pushing Kirsten Cinema out in front saying, she's the problem. She's the problem on drug prices. They're elevating her. A lot of the off the record quotes that you get hearing uh, Kirsten Cinema's uh, opposed to drug price reform is coming from those people. <laughs> it's coming from those me members of Congress and their staff. And they, think that by hiding behind Kirsten Cinema, they can draw fire to her and be able to uh, oppose this bill on behalf of their pharmaceutical company donors without any fingerprints on it. That's and, what's going on. And they and they they seem to be correct. I mean, this is a <laughs> failure this show. They've gotten away with it. Yeah, honestly, though, I mean, it, it, it seems to be a failure by by the 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 media. It seems to be a failure of outside groups. It seems to be a failure of the uh, Democratic House and Senate and, and frankly, uh, presidential leadership because they're not using the media or these outside groups to put pressure on these people. I mean, this is just, it's stunning. Well, we're gonna do some more reporting on uh, outside groups. I actually have a, a, a piece going up pretty soon about that, but uh, not personally, but at the prospect. Um, uh, but you mentioned the White House. And the White House had a critical role to play here that they decided not to play. 
And uh, there's a complicated reasons for that. But um, the White House has a number of tools to lower drug prices. Uh, the administration, based on prior laws that were already passed by Congress, can reduce the cost of prescription drugs by uh, taking patents on drugs that were uh, used public support in order to develop them, uh, by using a, a, a section of the U.S. Code called eminent domain for patents, uh, which, you know, you, you pay off the company uh, for their patent and then you give it, distribute it to someone else who will de deliver that drug more cheaply. Um, there are a number of other ways as well, but those are, the, that's the big one. That's sort of the killer app here. The, the White House could have said, okay, Scott Peters, Josh Gottheimer, uh, uh, what have you, we're going to take all the patents of these companies that uh, you you that are enriching you so much, and uh, we're going we're going to get other generic manufacturers to distribute them. Or you can play ball and actually do the thing that the entire rest of the caucus wants to do. So they could have used executive action as leverage, right, to get what they want, and they chose very specifically not to. There was a report. Uh, from the Health and Human Services Department that came out a month ago. It was based on Biden's competition order, this executive order that said, you know, about promoting competition in the U.S. economy. It was supposed to be a roadmap for how to lower drug prices, a comprehensive roadmap. They punted on that specific question of, of uh, whether to seize patents. And uh, I am told that it was Pelosi and Schumer who told them to do that. Who said, "Don't threaten our members. Don't do. Don't don't work it that way because uh, it will. There will be a backlash." And that was a total mistake on the part of the leadership. Rick there Mark. hasn't been any. I mean, Chuck Schumer is famously a concierge. It seems to me for uh, his membership. But this is this is like there hasn't been any of that. None of it. It seems like, and it, it is. It seems to be completely contrary. To at least Joe Biden's, um, I mean Chuck Schumer. I, I like if if someone told me that Chuck Schumer has been, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, down in summering in in South Carolina for the past three months, I, I wouldn't. I, I would be like, oh, that 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 sounds about right. Um, I mean, he he seems to have been he seems completely vanished from the scene. It seems to me, in terms of what he's doing here, or at least his uh, efficacy, um, and he. he I mean, Joe Biden's going to pay the price. It seems to me more than uh, more than Schumer or Pelosi on some level. Um, but at least politically, there doesn't seem to be any of that arm twisting that's come from the White House or from uh, the Democratic leaders. I mean, there's still time since they're trying to put together a drug price uh, a piece to add to this. There's certainly still time for for Biden to do that, but. Um... You know, we, we, we just haven't seen it. And uh, uh, we, we, we end up with what we got. Um, I, I want to get into, uh, let's get into what's in the bill. But then I want to just ask mm -hmm. you a brief, I mean, I know uh, on Twitter, someone was asking you about um, the day one agenda. And um, you, you guys are tracking that over at your EAT, as you call it, the uh, executive the action tracker at uh, right. the, the prospect. I love the acronym that's uh, that eat um, folks can check that out and maybe we'll talk more about that afterwards. But the real key point is, is that they could have used the their authority as a way of saying you've got two choices, either a you negotiate or B, you don't own the patent anymore. And that's it. You never make another dime after after we pay you off with the patent. And I imagine there's a bunch of other sort of like things that they could threaten that um, would have put the onus on the lawmakers and the corporate interests to decide, do we want to go into the fire or do we want to stay in the frying pan? And it's right. up to them. I mean, otherwise you just have sort of a one-way ratchet, right? I mean, if there's no counterweight to large, powerful corporate interests who want to keep the status quo, then guess what happens? Right. I mean, there, there's you, you have to come up with a counterweight, whether that's through executive action or whether that's playing industries off one another. Uh, uh, you know, whatever way that you could figure out to, to get that done, that that would have been the imperative if if 
you know, there was a president seater, I know. Yes. That would have been the imperative. Well, uh, there's still time, but uh, that's it's not happening anytime. Senator? Very soon. Senator Seder? Very soon. Stepping we'll stone? See. Yeah. Um, there are many people are saying it. Many people. Many people. Many people. Have many said. people. Um, let's talk about what's in the bill. Um, and, 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 you know, I guess the major things that are out, um, the, uh, we don't know about the drug prices yet. We don't know about state and local, uh, tax deductions yet. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, sadly, when I say that there's that, that, that the, the drug price thing will create all this budget savings, it'll probably be totally eaten up by this <laughs> repeal. Right. Of the state by the local tax deduction. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let's start with, I guess, the uh, climate investments. Um, uh, 555 billion as of today, anyways, mm -hmm. and about a fifth of that is to dealing with climate change as opposed to trying to mitigate it or prevent right. it to, to the extent that we can. Um, where does that wh wh where does that come in in terms of expectations? Like, what are what are uh, well, uh, climate hawks saying the, about this? The uh, the Biden framework called for, I think, uh, 600 billion in, in the resiliency slash uh, climate uh, clean energy space. So they didn't really come down very much. And that's, that's with you know, a guy who, whose campaign ad took a rifle and shot a cap and trade bill uh, as, as the fulcrum point. So uh, I, think, I think climate hawks are pretty, pretty pleased from a relative standpoint with this with this uh, legislation. It does include a couple things like it does not repeal fossil fuel tax credits. Uh, I think that, that maybe is the biggest sticking point. Uh, what tax credits it gives to things like uh, carbon capture and nuclear pretty minimal. Um, this actually is a very large investment in incentives for clean energy. Uh, there are no penalties, very few penalties uh, for not moving forward on clean energy in the bill, which was this main centerpiece, right? The clean energy performance program, which would have said to utilities, uh, we'll give you money if you start, you know, greening your uh, set of electricity and we will penalize you if you don't. That was the, 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 the centerpiece of the bill that came out, but all of that money or virtually all that money was moved towards uh, incentives, tax credits for construction of clean energy, manufacturing, uh, insourcing supply chains on things like solar and wind and steel and aluminum and things like that, um, electric vehicle rebates, energy efficiency rebates. Um, it, it's about five times the amount of what was in the stimulus package uh, in 2009, which did yield uh, a boom in certain clean energy investment, yep. things like Tesla and, and, and things like that. So uh, if you listen to people who have modeled this stuff, they say that this will put us on pace to get at or near the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that, that President Biden promised, uh, which was 50% reduced from current levels, I believe, by uh, 2030. Um, we'll have to see if that happens, uh, but there's certainly a lot of money floating around in this space uh, that uh, hopefully will uh, be channeled correctly. Implementation will be the key. Oh, that's good. All right. Well, um, and then it's sort of downhill from there, although the um, let's talk about the child tax credit. You said it becomes fully refundable permanently. Had that been just like periodically fixed every year? It actually was never refundable until... Uh, either until the Trump tax cuts or until the, um, the ARP, the, the American oh, Rescue okay. Plan. I, I think it might've been the American Rescue Plan actually that first made this refundable. Otherwise, if you didn't earn enough or if you didn't, you didn't owe enough in taxes, you wouldn't get the full child tax credit. Now, now, now it becomes more like, and I'm, 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 I'm revising myself to say it was the American Rescue Plan that changed this to make it more like a real child allowance. Uh, that that nobody is restricted from it so and that's should, good but the, yes. the, the 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 expansion of it which goes from 2000 a year to 3000 a year and 3600 for the child under 6 that only lasts one more year okay and uh, so it's, you know it's going to be an interesting lame duck session uh, of this congress 
to see if they're going to extend that once again uh, and uh, whether they will also extend the earned income tax credit for childless adults, which was also extended for one year in this bill. Um, so and we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens there. These refundable tax credits, we should just say, they're payments. Like, I, I don't know why we have to obscure so, um, you know, such effort in obscuring what this is um, by calling them a refundable tax credit. It's just absurd to me. Well, they have to kind of limit the uh, popularity of the program, right? There needs, they need to find a way to handcuff themselves. I mean, sadly, with one hand behind, tied behind their back. <laughs> sadly, they didn't take it for, far enough. If these are refundable tax credits, then they're not spending, and they shouldn't have counted against any kind of spending limit right. that, that Manchin put on it. But unfortunately, we've got the worst of both worlds. They're called refundable tax credits, and they count towards that cap. Um, there is a um, free print, uh, pre kindergarten, pre K, universal pre K. Um, that last you say six years there's a um a there's a subsidies uh, oh sorry and so yeah. that is that's there for six years and that's about as you know permanent as anything that we can expect in the context of this short of that uh, refundable uh tax credit for the lower sort of uh version of that refundable tax credit and then there are child care subsidies that uh, go up to 250% of the state median income, which is a pretty high threshold, you write. Um, and you credit that to Matt Brunig, the People's Policy Project, making a big fuss about it. Um, they're both only six years. Although the good news is that at, at the very least, like <laughs> maybe things are looking better in 2027. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, know. Here's, here, here's, here's the thing to talk about with that, is that you have two programs. And they're both dealing with uh, taking care of young children, one in education context and one in just sort of a management context, right? Um, they're both essentially the same idea, right? The only difference is pre-K is for three-year-olds and four-year-olds and childcare is for one and two-year-olds and, and maybe five-year-olds. So, but they're vastly different in terms of how they are treated here. Pre-K is universal. In other words, everyone with a three or four-year-old child can access it. It's free. It, there, is, there, is no, there is no co-payment. Uh, and uh, there is no asset test. There is no income test. You don't have to be working. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's basically two more years of the K through 12 education system. Right, it, right. it turns us into a 14-year education system. Child care, on the other hand, is not free. It's, uh, there's a co-payment. Uh, no one will pay more than 7% of their income uh, up to that 250% of the state median wage. Uh, 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 but there, there is a co-payment. It's a sliding scale uh, so that if you make a little bit, you're, it's free. If you make a little bit more, it's maybe 2% and 4% and 7% and so on. Uh, there's an income test because of you have to determine how much you owe, right? So there's an income test. There's an asset test. You can't have more than $1 million in assets or else you don't qualify for this. There is an activity test. In other words, you have to be working or seeking a job in order to do this. So imagine the application, by the way, for, for this, for childcare. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I mean, uh, there's a problem also with both of these programs that's separate from this I'll talk about in a second. But these are like the same program, right? And one of them is incredibly onerous and one of them is not. And do you know why that is? Sam? Oh, I have a good, I, well, I know that you've, you've written. I know, I know why you think that is. Um, well, let me, because, go yeah, ahead. Go, it's because Joe Manchin, when he was governor of West Virginia, instituted a universal pre-K program. And when he did it, he realized in order for it to be popular, he should not have all of this bureaucratic hassle attached to it and just make it two more years of the public education system. And that's what he did. And that's what he was comfortable with doing for the rest of the country. But he was not comfortable with doing that on child care. And, and let's be clear here. All those things you outlined, this is not about I, I am quite convinced 
that when stuff like that gets larded up, it is not about keeping the undeserving from getting these benefits. It is for, about keeping the deserving in the, in the minds of, of whoever imposed this from getting those benefits. It is to prevent people from engaging in, in the program, not to prevent people who don't qualify. It is to prevent people who do qualify, the people who need it the most, because it, 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 because as you write, you need to become like some type of actuarial to figure out this stuff. It becomes like it, this administrative task that, 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 that like people go to school for, for, for a year to figure out. It's the equivalent of the insurance company putting their office on the eighth floor of a building with no elevators. Right. So that only people who can walk eight flights up can get to their insurance, which means the sick people that can't do that don't get there. I mean, that's what it is. And 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 I am quite convinced that somewhere in some uh, some office, somebody has a demographic breakdown of those people who need child care for one and two year olds and rely on on child care and could benefit the most from it versus those who don't. Wealthier people tend to be able to afford to have one parent take a certain amount of time, spend time with the kids at those times, or they have a, a, a nanny or whatnot. And so this is, it is one of those things that ostensibly is set up so that you're not like letting billionaires come in and get free childcare. But right. in fact, what you're really doing is preventing um, working well. people from accessing it. And you're pissing everybody off in the process because then they have to uh, accumulate all these forms and pay stubs and everything in order to, to get the subsidy. The other problem with the way that these things are structured and it was also done to save money is that they are both federal state partnerships. Um, uh, uh, both of them start out with the federal government paying the freight on, on setting up these programs for the first three years. But then they gradually go down so the states have to contribute a share. So in preschool, uh, that goes down uh, in a th after the first three years, it's 100 percent. And then the next three years, it goes down eventually to 60 percent. So the states have to pay 40 percent of the cost of setting up these preschool programs. Uh, in child care, it's 90 percent. After the first three years, it's it's 90 percent. So the states have to kick in 10 percent. Um, we know exactly how this works, right? We saw this in Medicaid, in the Medicaid expansion, when red states had to include only a 10% share of their own. Uh, even if it was a good deal for them, ideologically, they're not going to start well during, uh, during uh, Obamacare the, Medicaid right. or Biden care preschool. So this is going to create an unequal system throughout the country where red states do not participate in these programs. And if you're trying to extend them after six years, when they are uneven and not everywhere in the country, how are you going to make the case that that is, is, is the thing to do? To be fair, if there's any opportunity, if there's any part, I mean, we saw a lot of these states reject, um, reject Medicaid funding when it was, when they would actually make money off of it during uh, the pandemic. Right. Right. So, so, I mean, the whole point of making it a federal state partnership is the problem, regardless of the rate at which you uh, you, you assess. Because that. you don't want them to have any type of authority over uh, veto. implementation or veto, veto over the implementation. OK, so let's uh, let's keep going through here. We have uh, home and community based care. It's at one hundred and fifty billion. Um, it is. Um, if, if I remember correctly, that was originally a four hundred billion. Is that right? That was originally a four hundred billion dollar uh, assessment, and and there was uh, the the experts passed around this letter a, a few weeks ago, showing and demonstrating based on on uh, uh, Office of Management budget fig figures that there is no way to achieve the goals of home and community based care, and there are two goals: one. Uh, affordable access for everyone who wants it, and two, raising the wages, some of the lowest wage people in our economy, you can't do it for less than $250 billion over 10 years. And so now they're going to try to do it for $150 billion over 10 years. And and, and I, I I mean, the numbers are the numbers. I, I don't know how this is going to work. Um, 
health care, premium tax credits and the Affordable Care Act um, are smooth, which basically smoothed out these big cliffs that took right. place at 400 uh, percent above uh, poverty. And as they're extended to 2025, I mean, I my feeling is if you're going to extend something, then at the very least, put it into the next administration so that either if. Joe Biden was to win an election or the Democrats will win election in 2024. There's at least some notion that there might be some ability to pass some things. And if it's and if they lose, then at least the political price is paid by uh, Republicans to the extent that they care. I, I think uh, to the extent that they care is doing a lot of work in that sense. I, I mean, I, especially I, I, when you're talking about something like Obamacare, when it was very hard for them to repeal and replace it. But it would not have been hard at all for them to just for them let to do something nothing. die. Yep. Uh, yep. And and that that will be the position that they're in if they win the presidency in 2024 uh, with respect Housing. to these tax credits. And by the way, uh, this also makes eligible uh, individuals in the Medicaid non-expansion states, those 12 states like Georgia and Wisconsin, and some of the others. Uh, those people who would have been eligible for Medicaid if their states expanded it can now go on the insurance exchanges and get free coverage. That, um, that, that's so that's, that's a, a good fix, except it, it, it could reverse itself at one point. I mean, that's the problem. Well, it's it's a I mean, there's actually a legal problem with it. Um, and it's uh, Paul Starr uh, at our our website, the prospect uh, wrote about this. Um, you're essentially having two classes for states. There's one that uh, expanded Medicaid and pays 10% of the cost. And uh, there's another that didn't expand Medicaid and actually benefits by that by having the government pay 100% of the cost, right? So, uh, and, and there's a question as to whether uh, the Supreme Court will see that as, as unequal in some way and strike it down. Um, so, so that's a, a pretty big concern here. Uh, that's not hard to imagine. The Supreme yeah. Court striking down something like that. All right, and so um, in in the in, in Medicare, early in this process, we thought maybe people at age sixty or fifty five will be eligible for Medicare, and when they are, they'll get dental, they'll get vision, they'll get hearing coverage. And now it's just down to stays at sixty five. And is it just hearing, which seems to me to be sort of also like dubious insofar as we just days ago, the FDA said uh, that they're going to allow for hearing aids to be sold non-prescription, which right. it seems to me a lot of the savings are going to end up coming from that. Yeah, I mean, that's for low and middle moderate hearing loss. So they're, they're obviously people with stronger hearing loss and bigger problems are going to benefit right from 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 having Medicare coverage for hearing. But Hearing is the cheapest of the three. I mean, you, you want to know why they, they pick hearing out of, out of hearing, vision, and dental? It's because hearing is the cheapest. And uh, so it's, uh, I mean, I, it's good, I suppose. And I, I, it's not entirely clear to me how permanent it is. Um, but I, I, it, to the extent that it is, uh, it's good to have a hearing benefit in Medicare. Uh, and it, the bill actually more quietly makes mandatory dental vision and hearing in Medicaid, which some states, most states, I believe, have that coverage embedded in Medicaid, Already. but some don't. And uh, this would say that this is a mandatory benefit. If you're going to get federal money for Medicaid, you have to include uh, dental vision and hearing in your package, in your suite of benefits. So that's positive. I mean, there's a whole larger problem about uh, it being difficult for uh, Medicaid beneficiaries to get someone to accept the insurance. Right. Um, but there is some money for housing or, or from uh, for healthcare supply, I should say, uh, to to have more doctors, more nurses, uh, that maybe will help uh, increase the ability of folks to uh, who have Medicaid to get get coverage. We get, should get say care. people at this point know that paid parental and medical leave is is out. Um, right. On some, in some respects, you know, based upon what you wrote in the New York Times and then uh, Brunig, uh, Brunig's analysis of it, that might be actually a better thing. It's almost better to have, have people to not let the air out of the tire with something that ends up being 
um, really less, more trouble than it's worth, frankly. Yeah, it was, it was going to be a bad program. It was going to look a lot like the private insurance system. It was going to be mostly managed through employers by private life insurers. And uh, the path dependence being what it is, that's probably the way it would have stayed. And it would have been enormously frustrating for people. Uh, and, and life insurance companies who manage the benefit would have made money off denying uh, paid leave to people. And, and we have actually are seeing this in real time. The New York Times had a report at the beginning of this week uh, about Amazon doing this to people, uh, uh, denying paid leave to warehouse workers during the pandemic. Um, so uh, uh, that's what the whole system would have looked like, and I, I don't think that would have been good. Uh, a paid leave that was along the lines of Kirsten Gillibrand's uh, 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 Family Act, that would have been great. Uh, and and, and, and we, we, even if you got that for a short period of time, that would have been great, but uh, that's not what was on the table. Um, and just, just quickly, the tax provisions. I mean, um, the, the billionaire tax, uh, that sounded pretty good to me. Um, I like a tax that um, essentially like cuts into people, cuts cuts into billionaires' wealth. I mean, I, I you know, I'm not uh, someone who necessarily feels that we need to tax to pay for these things. I want the tax to, to. I mean, obviously, it's been set up that way, and I understand that's the the nature of of, of this uh, project that they they have going. But I want to see a tax that will actually be used as a method. To um, to reduce to the extent it can uh, wealth inequality, and the billionaire tax did that, and that sounds like it's bye bye. What what is well, what's Sam? In? Sam, as a, as a virtuous billionaire yourself, sitting in your palatial studio there, uh, it's Thank very you. nice of you to uh, you know be so be be so generous and wanting to sacrifice for the greater good. Unfortunately, your fellow billionaires do not agree. And uh, so, uh, yeah, the billionaire tax, which came in very late in the game, uh, the mark to market tax, sometimes it's called, uh, was taken out. In its place, there were some uh, additional brackets put in, uh, surcharges on, on uh, multimillionaires. Uh, but, but that's based on income, right? That's an income surcharge. And what we know is that billionaires make most of their money not through income, not through a paycheck they get, but through capital and, and through making money because they have money. Um, and, and, and that will remain untaxed, essentially. So there is this surcharge, however, so, so the rich will pay a little bit more. Um, there's a tax on your favorite thing, stock buybacks that got into the bill. That's good. Um, there is a, what they call a corporate minimum tax um, and this is a 15% minimum tax on the profits that companies report. Uh, uh, report to investors, right? Not what they report to the IRS, because right. you, can, you can play accounting games. But what they say to investors, when they say on a conference call, hey, we made $11 billion this year, we're great. The IRS is going to say, well, we're taking 15% of that, because a company like Amazon in 2018, who did make $11 billion in, in profit, paid zero dollars in tax. And uh, so, so this is a way to have at least- That'll some hit about 700 tax. companies is my understanding, right? Is that about I mean, it? I think a little less actually, I think 200 companies. In fact, oh. it was supposed to be at, for companies who made a uh, hundred million or more in profits. And it ended up at companies that make a billion or more in annual profits. And according to uh, Angus King, who's the independent from Maine Senator, uh, he said the Biden administration is, is who uh, uh, changed that that threshold and uh, led to it being half as 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 viable, uh, uh, raising about half as much money as it could have. Um, uh, there's there's also uh, a global minimum tax. This was negotiated at uh, uh, among among hundred plus nations. Uh, this will uh, presumably help to stop outshoring, uh, uh, offshoring and outsourcing. Um, there's, there's some other uh, uh, taxes in there for the wealthy, uh, uh, what they call the net in investment income tax or the NIT. Uh, that gets extended to partnerships and, and, and S corporations. Uh, all of this stuff is very, very kind of technical. Uh, the other big thing is that there's an $80 billion investment in the IRS. 
And that is uh, intended to yield something like $400 billion back uh, to close what they call the tax gap, which is the money that is legally owed to the government under the current tax laws that is not actually paid. Um, and so uh, the IRS will be fairly transformed by this, uh, this setup and able to go after uh, people uh, who don't pay their taxes. So um, anyway, uh, uh, this, this yielded enough money to get to the uh, $1.75 trillion threshold. All right, is there anything that we're forgetting, you think? Housing, uh, we should talk about housing, uh, the initial housing investment, which was one of the few places in the bill that really looked at supply. It was like trying to build more houses uh, to, to lower costs. Um, that was initially, the investment was $320 billion, ended up getting $150 billion. And uh, the way it did that was really just cut everything in half rather than prioritize a few things and give all the money to that. Um, so that was the big one. And then, uh, you know, there are a host of other little things. I talk about a lot of them in my pieces up at the prospect. And, uh, you know, I, I just feel like if, if this thing was a little more focused, uh, that would have been a good idea. A, a perfect example is um, there's money for pandemic preparedness in the bill. And you would think that since we're in a pandemic, that money for pandemic preparedness would be a kind of a top priority. Um, the Biden administration initially asked for 30 billion. They then cut their ass to 15 billion and they got 10 billion. And, you know, nickel yeah. and nickel and diming on, on pandemic preparedness. What's the worst, what's the worst <laughs> could happen with the pandemic? <laughs> exactly. I mean, come on. <laughs> haven't we all gotten, uh, haven't we all, uh, we got uh, the shots, some... so we're good. Yeah, yeah, we all, yeah, we have, uh, uh immunity because everybody's caught it. So there it is. We're all good. Um, well, uh, David Dan, thank you for uh, giving us this, um, you know, somewhat depressing uh, presentation. I mean, I mean, I let me just say in the final analysis, uh, you know, what's what would be depressing is no bill, right? I mean, this is a a, a real effort to tackle the climate crisis. Uh, it does some good for a few years, at least, uh, for a number of items. Uh, if the breaks go our way, then maybe you can extend these things out. Um, this is going to help people. I mean, it's just not going to help as many people as, as it could or, or as in, in my view so, as it should. Okay. And so in your mind, it is a, a failure of, of A, creating and managing expectations, but B, optimizing what was uh, potentially available in this moment. And then C, I would imagine also the fact that like, the, there's probably this is probably it for a long right. time. So right, uh, I mean, the depending on what you stuff. right, depending on what you believe about the the trajectory of U.S. politics, then yeah, the, this the you know you could believe that this was it. I I I should say that just as we did a reconciliation bill this year, you could always do one next year uh, if you wanted to to finish the job. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of appetite for that <laughs> within Congress, but, uh, but it's available. It's available. If you want to, I mean, there's scenarios where good. one could think of this, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, you uh, could see a reconciliation bill on the child tax credit, uh, at, in, in the lame duck session, uh, next year at, that, that could extend it out, uh, as, uh, I mean, could extend it permanently if you wanted. I guess it's also possible that like, you know, any given senator would be, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, uh, get hit by a bus and then their estranged, uh, you know, partner would take over that uh, thing and had different politics than them and then would pass it. And then I mean, I, the scenarios are so obvious where this could we could see this uh, come back around next fall. Um, David Dan, Definitely. always a pleasure. Thank you so much for for joining us right, and walking us through folks. Um, uh, and we, we will catch up on the day one agenda. Oh, I, I just one last question. Do you think that we're going to see more of those day one agenda initiatives after this is over? In other words, is, has the Biden administration well, been I, waiting I, to do unilateral things uh, or are they just like. I, I mean, I can't answer that uh, in terms of waiting. Uh, they should. Um, 
you know, I mean, some of it is that you got to get your people in place and, and some of these processes take a long time. You got to do, you know, you got to go through administrative procedure. And so there should be more as you go along. Uh, whether there will be, I mean, if Biden wants to be a successful president, there will be. Yep, I agree. I can't wait until he uh, forgives uh, $75,000, up to $75,000 of, uh, of college loan debt. I'm sure that's going to happen in a couple of weeks after we get this bill. And uh, David, we'll hold you that to, All right. to that. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, David. All right. Speaking of David, let's bring in another David uh, onto the program. Do we have him? He'll be David joining. Sirota, the uh, founder and publisher, editor of the Daily Poster. Did I get those right, uh, David? I prefer, tru I prefer Troublemaker. Troublemaker uh, at yeah. the Daily Poster. Problem um, creator. Problem creator. I Joker. Uh, Joker. 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 Five. Joker. There we go. Uh, David, thanks for joining us. Obviously, Emma's here. Um, I, I want to talk about, I mean, on some level, your your, um, your podcast uh, that has come out, or I guess it's coming out today or tomorrow. It was uh, uh, this week. Yeah. Yesterday. So it's okay. just out. Yeah. Um, at Meltdown. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like, it's almost like just in time for the sequel to be released. <laughs> right. Um, all right. Let's just briefly let, uh, tell us about Meltdown and then let's talk about what we have here. I mean, I, it's a, it's a, it's a different scenario, obviously. Uh, but, um, it, it, in many respects, we heard when the Biden administration came in that they learned the lesson of the Obama administration. I'm quite convinced that they did not, uh, in fact, at the end of the day, learn the lesson. I'm not sure exactly which lesson they learned. They may have learned a lesson. It seems like they may have in terms of judges, but that may be a little bit late. But they didn't learn um, the too much lesson from uh, what you talk about in Meltdown. What What is Meltdown about? All right. So Meltdown, and, and I want to be clear. This was not released in conjunction with the real world sequel of Meltdown, meaning it did not, we did not time it to come out this way, but it, it happened to come out this way. Fortuitous. Um, I, I, yeah, or unfortunate for the country in, in terms of what's actually happening. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm just looking out for just you here. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Meltdown takes a look, uh, focuses in on the 2009 2010 period uh, where Obama came into office uh, in the middle of a huge crisis, a different kind of crisis uh, than we face today, but certainly a huge. Uh, economic crisis. And he came in promising all sorts of, of things. In, in particular, he was going to get tough on Wall Street. Uh, and what ended up happening is that they didn't really get tough on Wall Street. They engineered a top-down bailout, which sent most of its resources to a handful of financial institutions, not a bottom-up kind of bailout. Uh, they watered down their Wall Street reform bill. Uh, they did a very, a way too small stimulus bill in the middle of this crisis. Millions of people were foreclosed on, did not get very much help from the government at all. In many cases, the government made things uh, worse because the kind of Rube Goldberg machine they set up in these small programs to try to help people really were part of the Democratic Party's contradiction, which still remains today. And we'll get to that. But the contradiction being trying to serve your corporate donors while also telling voters you're solving the problems that your corporate donors are making. And when you do that, you end up sounding incoherent and you end up putting forward policies that don't really solve those problems. And so what ended up happening was, in the broad strokes, there was a lot of disillusionment in the country. Uh, a lot of people were angry. Uh, and the Republicans were given a political bailout. Uh, they were able to win the 2010 election after, by the way, many pundits said they were gone. They were done as a party. Goodbye. I mean, I after 2008, it, I mean, there's all these quotes, by the way, from these pundits saying that's it. They're never going to come back. There's no way they're even going to even be able to compete in the 2010 election. And then, of course, they they did in the 2010 election. And, they, and ultimately, it created the conditions for Donald Trump. And so the basic story is, is that if you don't deliver for voters when you promise to come in during a crisis and you've promised them that you're going to deliver and you don't you're not willing to take on your corporate donors and you're not willing to have an intra party battle with the right wing corporate uh, segment of the democratic party then you voters are going to 
say, going to get mad and they're going to vote for change again. And there are going to be dishonest right wing opportunists right around the corner ready to take advantage. So update that to today. And it does sound very similar. You've got an economic crisis uh, for large numbers of Americans. Uh, we're in a different kind of crisis. It's a pandemic. Uh, and the Democrats have spent months watering down and in some cases betraying their key promises to voters. Uh, we've now seen the uh, reconciliation, the, 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 the spending package go from a proposed $6 trillion to $4 trillion to $3.5 trillion to $1.9 trillion, now to $1.8 trillion, uh, and all sorts of wildly popular programs being publicly stripped out of the bill. I mean, one of the things I thought was uh, incredible, and you, know, you read the D.C. press to get, in some cases, the, the take on how D.C. is talking to itself. And it kind of gives away some of how ridiculous it is. There was a Politico story that said the Democrats have to strip out allowing Medicare to negotiate lower prescription drug prices in order to get a deal with the party. And of course, those provisions are literally in polls the single most popular thing that would be in the bill, the thing that Americans say they most want. So in other words, in order to get a deal they apparently have to take out the thing that most Americans want. And the big question then becomes is what message are you sending to voters? Because you're also going to voters saying, hey, you got to elect us to defend democracy. And a lot of voters end up saying, look, we just used democratic institutions to elect you to solve problems that you promised to solve. And you just betrayed those promises. So when you go to voters and you say, we need to defend democracy, more and more voters are, are saying, well, I, who cares? Like, does my vote even matter? And that's the real danger here is a repeat of 2009 and 2010 that led to Trump repeating that again and getting Trump or something worse. You know, um, the uh, I mean, there's a lot to go over there. I mean, for me, the the sort of the original sin of the Obama administration came even before he was president. And that's when um According to Barney Frank, if I remember correctly, um, Paulson was going to sign off on a program to bail out homeowners directly. What we ultimately did was to bail out the banks with the sort of gentleman's agreement. And I do mean gentlemen's <laughs> agreement that they're going to loosen up things and make it easier for homeowners instead of going to the homeowners giving them money and direct relief and letting that flow up through the banks. They wanted to go the other direction. But Paulson was saying, I'm open to going directly to the homeowners. He was the chairman of the Fed. I'm open to doing that. I just need, and this is when Barack Obama was president elect. I just need Obama to sign off on it. And uh, Barney Frank uh, went over to, uh, uh, to Obama and said, he's prepared to do this. And Obama said, well, we only have one president at a time. And, and, uh, the, and the reality was we didn't even have one at that time uh, in, in the interim. And, and that was, I think ultimately, you know, we talk about doing the bidding of their corporate donors. I think that relationship is, it's not just that, that the corporate donors have the money and they've asked for this. It's that this is the, the waters that they swim in. And I think Barack Obama genuinely believed that Robert Rubin and all the bankers, that these people, they belonged at the top of our uh, society and they know what is good for, you know, and that they are the masters of the universe and they genuinely understand this. And so he just did what they said. And of course, from their perspective, like, yeah, you save the banks. It's the most important thing. Saving the banks is the most important thing. And, and I want to I want to add there was a quote. I mean, Tim, Tim Geithner, his Treasury secretary, kind of said that. I mean, according to Neil Borofsky, who is the inspector general of the bailout fund, that, that uh, Tim Geithner told Borofsky and Elizabeth Warren, listen, you don't understand. And I'm paraphrasing here. He said, you don't understand. We are trying to slow the foreclosures, not necessarily end the foreclosures, because what we're trying to do first and foremost is, and this is a direct quote, according to Borofsky, foam, foam the runway the, yeah. for the banks. That in other words, millions of human beings were the foam on the runway to make sure that the bankers uh, had a safe landing. And I think you're right. What you're describing, Sam, is 
what I call and what's been called ideological capture. That we think of corruption, there's one form of corruption, which is cash stuffed in the sweaty envelope and handed to the politician in exchange for the vote or the project. Now, and, he goes, but, and he goes and buys a houseboat, let's say. Just, <laughs> right. I mean, just, yeah. just, just as an example. Like <laughs> yeah. Now, look, Barack Obama raised the most amount of Wall Street money in the history of presidential politics. So, you know, there's, there's some of that. But what that at that level ends up often buying is it's not here's a quid pro quo on a direct program. It's I'm just going to immerse you in this world, in a bubble where the only all possible policy alternatives are things that benefit the people and that bubble you're surrounded by. Heads I win, tails you lose. That if all you're only hearing is, you know, look, I'm going to debate what to do about the financial collapse with Jamie Dimon or Lloyd Blankfein, right? These are my, and Robert Rubin right. and Tim Geithner. But guess what? Most of the, all the, the alternatives you're going to hear is, well, we can save the banks this way. We can save the banks that way. We can save the banks. That, oh, home, homeowners aren't even at the table. Homeowners right. are on the menu. It's like a, it's like one of those Daily Wire roundtables where it's, <laughs> right. uh, you know, um, uh, Ben Shapiro and, uh, you know, the the Knowles guy. And then that bo they're all just sitting around with a different flavor of yeah. right wing reactionary uh, reactionism. And they think that they're hashing things out. And, and, and you know, it's funny. I, I've told this story before, you know, uh, in, in 2009, I think it was. Um, when Elliot Spitzer was uh, on CNN, I, I somehow got invited to one. I, I suspect what what was one of his Christmas parties, the CNN one, and uh, he we, we, people were drinking, and and I had asked him almost specifically like about Obama in this regard, and he said Obama thinks these guys know what they're doing, yeah. and and yeah. Spitzer said, you know, I went to Princeton with them. I know that they're all C students and cheated yeah. tennis. I think it was, it was the actual quote, and 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 I think that was true. The case, I think Obama just was um, assumed for whatever reasons that these people knew what they were doing, and 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 that their understanding of what was most important was ultimately most important. And and I, uh, and I think we have to remember there's one thing that's always thrown at. At, at this argument. And we detail this in the podcast. And it's a really, I hope people will listen to it because I think remembering the reason it's important is not just to look back and say, well, what went wrong, but to say, what can't go wrong again? But I think what, what you often hear is, well, you know, but, uh, they had a Republican opposition and they couldn't have done anything. You hear that with Biden now. Oh, you know, they only have 50 Senate votes and, and Obama only had only, you know, 59 or 60 Senate votes at certain points. I mean, you know, Fine, if you want to make that argument. But here's the thing. When it came to that bailout, as one example, they had already passed it. He had the executive authority. It was a, it was a blank check yep. to decide how to use that money. And one mind boggling thing that comes out in the podcast, which even I had forgotten until I went and, and reported it out, was that at the very moment that they could have redirected a lot of that that money about there was about 300 350 billion dollars still in that pool of money at the very moment that obama could have done that the democrats pivoted to austerity yeah because they were they were being you know the republicans were saying, oh they're spending so much money and the democrats got kind of psyched out by that and they touted themselves for passing a bill to rescind the 300 plus billion dollars to essentially not allow their president, their own party's president, to spend it at the moment he could have directed it uh, into helping homeowners without Congress. And it's sort of the same thing with Biden to fast forward it. You hear, oh, you know, Biden can't do this on drug pricing and he can't do that. Uh, he can't, you know, because the Republicans and Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, and there's that whole rotating villain thing where, you know, it's always only one or two Democrats, but usually they're representing five or 10 Democrats. And, and, and even if you stipulate that, Joe Biden has all sorts of executive authority that he could be using right now. March in rights to lower drug prices, cancel student debt. Uh, he can uh, distribute the vaccines to other countries right now. He has refused to do that. And they make these legalistic arguments. But what you know, at the end of the day, those legalistic arguments are motivated by, we don't want to take on big pharma. Yeah. We don't want to take well, on the, the, the lenders. Well, I this mean, is, I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to add to David Dane was just on and he specifically, you know, cited the, what you're talking about with the with the drugs is that Biden has the ability to essentially practice eminent domain when it comes to patents yes. for some of these drugs. 
and he wouldn't even have to do it necessarily, but say to people like Gottheimer, say to people like uh, Menendez, right. yeah. who are who are the ones who are really killing this uh, uh, negotiate the drug prices, your um, your patrons have a choice. <laughs> Either I take their their patents, or they 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 allow you to vote for this. You and, tell them because the I'll way, do either one. And by the way, his HHS secretary, if you want to add a little, Becerra, sorry, yes, up, his HHS secretary Javier Becerra, who would be the guy to do that, literally a year ago, called for the Trump administration to do exactly that. He wrote a letter to the Trump administration, and he has been a longtime supporter. These are called so-called march in rights. He has been a supporter of that. So the fact that that's not even on the table, whether as a threat or whether as a real policy, that, that, that to me, that is inexcusable. And it feeds the, 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 the idea that it's all a rigged game. It's a wink and nod, that, they, that it's Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football. And ultimately, what do you expect voters take away to be from that, right? Voters may not know the details. Oh, I'm not sure if this or that provision is in, but, but voters understand the Democrats are in control of the government. It's up to them to figure out how they wrangle their party to do what they promised, but they made these promises. And if they don't deliver, then we should expect voters to vote for change. And the problem is, is that the alternate to that kind of change <laughs> right, right. is something much worse. Much worse. Emma. Well, I mean, I, I just I guess I wanted to flesh out because for the Obama administration, there was this ivory tower sensibility, right, where um, the experts know what they're doing. Oh, and yeah. uh, I mean, even the Wall Street crashed the economy, they're the experts, so they should be able to fix themselves. For Biden, even though functionally in the end, it's the same thing, it is this dogmatic belief in senatorial process again it ends up being a, a huge letdown either way but i mean when we were talking about maybe maybe hopefully the biden administration has learned from uh the lessons of the obama administration that ended up not being the case um you know, maybe that's what we were seeing. Okay, Biden isn't as committed to uh, stacking his entire cabinet with Citibank uh, recommended recommended executives, for example, or or, or personnel. Um, but I mean, in the end, all of these things are just barriers. Senate process versus experts on Wall Street from the democratic process and the will of the people actually reaching the levels of power. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, there's two two things I would add to that. One, the conflict aversion baked into the Democratic Party, the culture of conflict aversion when it comes both to Republicans, you know, all this fetishization of bipartisanship, uh, and and even more so, conflict aversion with internal party battles is a real problem. It serves the donor class. Barack Obama was unbelievably uncomfortable ever pressuring uh, a, a fellow Democrat. I think Joe Biden is also very uncomfortable with it. Uh, it, it. A huge contrast point, by the way, with people like Franklin Roosevelt, who literally ran primaries uh, against uh, Democrats who wouldn't get on board with the New Deal. Now, it didn't go uh, perfectly as planned for FDR when he ran those primaries, but the point is, I think we have to understand that culture of con conflict aversion, uh, uh, sort of senatorial, in, in this case, senatorial etiquette, uh, that that is a real thing and it is a really bad thing. Because again, at the end of the day, all that matters is whether you deliver. I will say this, I do think the Biden administration has learned one lesson. I do think they have learned to not tack back to austerity. What we see, the, the thing that we see in progress between the Obama administration and I think the Biden administration is that Ob Obama pivoted to austerity, not only by rescinding the TARP bailout, but even even more ridiculously, they pivoted to trying to cut Social Security. They were yeah, they were on to cut the the cost of living increases, so called entitlements, and they got all they got they got baited into that. And you know, we we published a piece at Rolling Stone, and I I don't like making I you know Godwin's law. I don't like making Nazi comparisons. But here's the thing: there's a new study out that looked at the county by county data uh, in uh, Weimar Germany. Uh, back in the 1930s. And what it found is, is that the counties that, that flipped hardest for the right-wing authoritarian Nazis were the counties that were hit hardest by 
cuts to German social security, cuts to uh, basic social services. That when you, you, you might think that when the government cuts social <laughs> services, people will tack to, the, oh, we're going to elect socialists, right? But it, what ends up happening is it creates a, a, a scarcity mentality, uh, a kind of xenophobia. Now, I'm not saying like, you know, Trump and his supporters are directly Nazis, but my point is, is that when you tack to austerity in the middle of a crisis, you create political opportunities for right wingers. And so Obama did that. And I do think that you can credit the Biden administration, even looking at its spending plan now, that it is said, look, we're not going to listen to the, uh, the, the so-called deficit hawks. I mean, the, I, I don't even like using that term Wait. because the deficit hawks push Pentagon spending and the like. But I think if you look at the spending bill, even the gutted spending bill, the deal that they are trying to make, I'm talking 50,000 foot view here is, we're going to take out almost everything that challenges the greed, the power, uh, and the wealth of the super wealthy and corporate America. I mean, there's some tax revisions and the like, but it, it is not a fundamental change. He is living up to his promise. The one campaign promise Joe Biden seems most uh, devoted to is right. nothing would fundamentally change. change that he said to his donors. But- the things that, that remain in there are the things that simply spend some money to do things that don't offend corporate America, uh, but at least uh, give people uh, uh, some crumbs to survive. And, and oh, the Obama administration wasn't really willing to do that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I will say, and, and look, he's there, he's president at this time, and I, I suppose there is a, a scenario where you could see him pivoting to austerity. Although with that said, there is no deficit hawks anymore. I mean, I mean, they, they still exist, but they are a rare bird. What's it incredible, Sam, be... he, it, Joe Biden was like the biggest deficit. Well, he but, was like but, Mr. Cut Social Security. Well, without a doubt, he went around Harry Reid, actually, to basically <laughs> undercut Harry Reid and really was pursuing this these cuts to COLA. It's it, an incredible time. turnaround. And, and Obama came into the office he, uh, you know, uh, uh, Heather Parton was on this for years. He gave an interview uh, in January of 2009 saying that we're going to have to look at entitlements, you know, which is code for cutting Social Security. Right. Um, but at that time, there was also a, a Republican Party that was uh, bemoaning deficit spending. And that, you know, that all just went away. Yeah. I mean, to, for the most part, there is no occasionally, you know, I think at one point Thune tried to come up in the wake of the COVID relief <laughs> bill and say, I, I got paid 20, whatever it was he said. And it, and, and I, that was the last we heard of him. Like I, yeah. if somebody told me he left the Senate. I wouldn't even know about it at this point. Well, they're, because trying, to, they're trying to flip the, the inflation stuff into an austerity argument. I don't think it's working. Just well, it's not yet. working because only four or five percent of of people in the latest Gallup poll, and this is the peak yeah. after all of this, are saying like well, inflation. What, what are you talking about? Like yeah. nobody's like it's not the inflation that we're experiencing. I don't think is uh, durable and is sort of like classic inflation. And and B, it is so sort of niche in specific areas that I don't think that people are experiencing in that way. So it's it's not working. I think like, you know, what we're gonna see in Virginia is that the CRT stuff may be working. That the the notion of like of 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 masks in school is going to animate the lunatics on the right, but I don't know if that's gonna work a year from now. So we yeah. will we will see in terms of the midterms. I should also just I wanted to note I knew what you just told us about Becerra because I read it in the Daily Poster. And uh, so I wanted to just uh, uh, credit you with that. Like, these are the type of stories you guys are doing it. And I really uh, uh, appreciate the work. I mean, I've told you Thank this you. before, but I, I really appreciate it. the work you're doing over there. Um, so, I mean, let me ask you this. What is your perspective? Let's assume that the the, the bill is what it is today, Okay. And um, I, I think I think they were be better off at starting at 1.7 trillion. Maybe they wouldn't have gotten there. Chuck Schumer might have helped people in his own party by telling him that he had signed a deal with uh, with, with with Manchin in in July. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think Biden. Um, you know, should never have invited the Republicans in uh, to this thing. They didn't seem to learn that lesson. Nobody cared that the Republicans were getting shut out of the process. Um, all that said, 
and I think the uh, uh, Dayan's assessment of they're doing a lot of things not so well, as opposed to a few things very well, which would have been the alternate way to cut down this bill. But if you were a progressive in the House next week and had to vote on the bill as it's written today, would you vote for it? You know, I, I, I'm being totally honest here. I, I, I haven't thought that far in advance because I'm, my, my point the entire time has been that the House progressives have to make public and specific demands about what they want in this bill. And they can still make those demands. They, they don't have to make 20 demands. They can make, how about one demand? Right. right? They have not been, specific. Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are throwing out red lines every, every ah, I can't do the tax, I can't do the drug. I get, the progressive just keeps saying, I want a robust bill. And my point is, is that they are still in a position to say, you are not getting our votes unless you put X or Y or Z in there. And, and they could say, listen, drug price negotiation drug price seems to me to be like a good, a good the full right expansion there. of the, of, of right. Medicare, you know, let's stop pretending that uh, teeth and eyes are not part of the human body. Right. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Right. Like we're only going to do hearing, but we're not going to do teeth and eye. what are we, like, what kind of macabre grotesquerie are we right. talking about here? Right. Like s put up something to show one, to get a, a victory on a policy, and two, to show that you're willing to fight for something, right? They have not done that yet. They can still do it. And what, what bothers me about it is, is that they're going out saying they're fighting for this and they're holding up. And, and it's good that they're keeping the, they're saying we're not going to vote for it unless it's with the infrastructure bill, it's kind of a process thing to keep the bill strong. But it still is kind of sus that they're like not saying what they 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 are they believe is a non-negotiable to be right. added into that bill it's like you're kind of trying to have it both ways to like look like you're fighting but not be specific about what you want in there and my point is is like have that fight like have that battle before you decide whether you're going to hold up the whole the entire bill and by the way it's not just the house progressives it could be bernie sanders it yep. could be Elizabeth Warren. And it's just like, and you know, why haven't you done that? Now, I, can, I think I can answer the question. The, the answer to the question is, I think, if we, if we presume, you know, not bad faith, is they're trying to keep their options open to get to yes uh, within the parameters of something general. If the bill is generally good, we want to be able to get to yes. Ryan Grimm at The Intercept has made this point uh, that they that some of them feel burned, that they said, we're not going to vote for the ACA unless it's got the public option in. And then, the, you know, the drug companies and the insurance companies got the public option out and a lot of them voted for it and they felt kind of ridiculous. Right. I, I, I get that. But it's also like you're not going to get what you what you purport to want unless you're willing to make a demand. That, and you know who proves that? Joe Manchin. Also, the the blue state but, Democrats who want the salt tax cuts. They keep saying we're not, we're not going to vote for the for the bill. Like that's how you play the game. Right. The problem the problem they have, and 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 uh, you know, I, I'm on the mind that they really should draw a line on something, even if it's something they think they can get already. Frankly, well, I mean, just, can I be cynical? Can I be right. cynical here? I, I'm I'm somewhat shocked that there hasn't been a kind of play action game where the White House comes out or the you know the leadership says, oh, we can't get that in. No way we can get that in. And then the House progressives say, we're not going to vote for this unless we get it in. And it's already a cut deal to give them a face saving right, victory. Right, like, I'm right. surprised that hasn't happened well, yet. I think the, the dilemma that they have, and it is always the dilemma, and there has never been a, an, an, a, a, a moment to fix it. And the only thing that they actually have done, and I think they deserve credit for that, is you know, holding up that bipartisan bill vote, because they also know that is like, that's the floodgates. If they vote for the bipartisan bill, no, then it's over. It, it feels like 50% of what still exists in the uh, reconciliation bill is gone. gone. I mean, that's that's the thing. So they're, they, they, that is a rear guard action that they're protecting what's in the bill to the extent that there's stuff in the bill now. The problem they have, as opposed to Gottheimer, or to, you know, uh, to, to Manchin or, you know, cinema for whatever reason, at the end of the day, if if nothing gets voted on, right, it's right. not as big of a deal for them. No, like, it's, it, I, I've said it, it's a fundamental asymmetry, and I think we have to be we have to we have to actually acknowledge that, 
And, and the asymmetry is this. Again, presuming not bad faith and not corruption, right. which, which I frankly, if you want to call you know, the squad or the Congressional Progressive Caucus all corrupt, I need to see some evidence that that's the case. I don't presume sort of corrupt mansion cinema-ish uh, bad faith on their part. It's not because I'm naive. It's because I don't see evidence of that. What I see is evidence of weakness, of fear, uh, and I also see an ev evidence of asymmetry. And we have to exactly. acknowledge it. And the asymmetry is they are not, they do not want to see the entire bill be taken down because they believe in the good things that are in that bill. I mean, everything from childcare subsidies to a somewhat expansion of Medicare to all the, there are a lot of good things there. You get federal funds for ACA, uh, for, excuse me, for DACA recipients uh, are, are are available. I mean, I think we'll, they're, they're going to be able to get like federal loans for, right. for schools. I mean, Mansion and that, don't care about that. They don't yeah, care. They, is they're that willing, structural? Yeah. Is that is that going? No, but it, is it going to make a material difference in the lives of of maybe you know tens of hundreds of thousands of people? Yeah, I mean, and, and that's a hard thing to vote to 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 sort of like you got it. It's a hard thing to just sort of say like. I'm going to bet that away. Exactly. And the other side, I mean, Gottheimer and, uh, you know, cinema's pharma donors, they'd be happy if the whole bill went away. Exactly. Like, they, they, they want, so, so that's the asymmetry. So figuring out where to draw that line is, a, is actually a really difficult thing. And so I also think, I want to say this, I think we all need to understand our roles. This is a, one of my big laments in, in our politics and media, that I don't have to think like a member of Congress, right? Because my role is not to try to, you know, figure out where the right. I mean, I, I think about it because you know I study this stuff. But my point is, is that people on in outside organizations, pressure groups, advocacy groups, their role is to push and push and push and not sheepdog, not tell people don't push, don't push what the day. Like, I think there is something so broken about sort of left of center politics in this way. You see so many Washington liberal advocacy groups. The minute Democrats say they, they're going to compromise, the advocacy groups, a lot of them seem to think that their role is to then go sell the compromise rather than to push. But the, their role is to push and push and push. The Democratic Party leader's role is to, if they have, if, if and when they compromise, they can sell their compromise. My role as an accountability journalist is to, you know, shine the spotlight on the corruption that, that created the compromise in order to, you know, a, a, in a sense, uh, inform people who want to ask for more, right? We have to understand our roles. And I think that lots of, of left of center uh, folks have have now gotten pundit brain that they think that their job in a in a democratic small d democratic society is to game it out to defend the politicians like your job as a citizen is to i think your responsibility is to see politicians as an input into a governmental machine so that the machine produces results that help the public your job is not to serve the politician your job is to try to get the politicians to produce something that helps people. But I think, you know, uh, 20 years of people being addicted to, you know, cable TV news has taught them, no, my job is to think like the politician, not to push the politician. That's a problem. I think, well, I, I, I think, I don't think it's just the latter part that has created that. It is also, we're in an era, really, that started with, with Howard Dean, where, um, the participation of the activist base, let's say, or a or a element of the activist base, we should say, right, and particularly the online one, is people doing fundraising, small donor fundraising, in a way that had never really happened before. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, uh, the the idea that um, you know uh, Jane Doe can be a bundler of uh, small donors because she has ten thousand uh, Twitter followers that that dynamic that's a new dynamic, yep. and so then you're 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 in a position of your you your you, strategy and 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 right. things like that. So I mean that's part of it too. It's not I I don't think it's you know. So I understand, like, on some level, the, the pundit sort of brain on both ends of the spectrum, you know, sort of uh, uh, doing that. But, yes, we have our roles and we've got to uh, to push. Right. Like I think my people... role is not to apologize 
and defend uh, Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, or frankly, you know, I work for Bernie Sanders. My role is not to defend Bernie Sanders if Bernie Sanders ends up selling out. I mean, I don't think he's going to end up selling out. I think he's trying to do his best. But my role is not, to, that is not my role. And I think this idea that it is, you know, our role to serve politicians as opposed to it is their job to serve the public is, is just fundamentally not as well understood as I think it used to be. I'm not idealizing the 60s and the 70s. You know, they made their compromise, you know, outside movements, the civil rights movements and the and the and the environmental rights movement and all the, the movements of the South. They, they made their, you know, compromises and what's realistic and what's not. But you don't get the sense that they were thinking about, you know, our job is to go out and defend so and so politician. I, I think to a certain extent we can overestimate how much of that exists in our society today because of the sort of the spaces that we work in and social media. Because, I mean, frankly, sure. and if you look back at like the level of trust in politicians, even in the 60s, was much higher than it is sure. today. Sure. But and, I also but I also think this. I think it, it you're right among rank and file, just people. I think it expresses itself as. Well, look, you know, but, you know, Biden got in there. He can't. How, how much can he really do? How much can we really ask him to do? I mean, you know, the Republicans are in. It's just sort of this acceptance that nothing huge can yes. happen and that you're like a crazy person to expect, you know, something so radical well, as like de like Medicare should make sure people, you know, people have teeth. Right. Like that's, that's the argument. Different. That's the argument why you do one or two small things, one or two things yeah, yeah. in a full big way, because yeah. the idea is. This is a taste of what a good governance can look like, as yes. opposed to a couple of programs that are hassles. Uh, you got more of the hassle programs as opposed to like one or two that are really solid. I mean, every I think sort of every good policy that we get in some way is leveraged off the success of something like Social well, Security. Let me give you let me give you an example uh, to go back to meltdown for a second. The TARP bailout. Millions of people are getting foreclosed on. They're watching headlines about hundreds of billions of dollars of their money going out the door to a handful of financial institutions, making matters worse. Some of that money is subsidizing Wall Street bonuses, the AIG, the whole AIG thing, right? The, which is our episode one of, of uh, Meltdown. Okay, compare the backlash to that. And I know the arguments, oh, you know, the banks supposedly paid back the money. You can make policy arguments they didn't pay back the money. You can make policy arguments saying that the TARP bailout was a good, a good policy. But just as in terms of, of people's trust in government. That was the situation you had. Everybody just got screwed and they're paying the bankers. You know, the question on everyone's mind is where is my bailout? Now compare that to how people felt about, for instance, the PPP. Okay, the PPP, which gave money to tens of thousands of businesses, not a perfect program. L waste, there was some fraud, there was some people shouldn't have gotten the money, but it was a broad based bailout. And guess what? It's relatively popular. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it never became a flashpoint for you know outrage, and it's because it was one program. Everybody could basically understand what it did, right? It was a big program, just gave people help, and there's a lesson there. Well, that, the other the other part of it was too. Let's remember that PPP came in the context of a lot of programs that provided a lot of material aid for people unemployed, for yes. people uh, you know everybody gets a check. I mean. There was a lot of other. Yes. Yeah, so what the government was saying, all that that all those together, I would argue, right. was one thing. The government is putting money out there to regular people to help people right now. And I think actually the takeaway is, is that it was a relatively popular set of initiatives because people felt like it materially improved their lives. Now, I think what's incredible to me is that Donald Trump botched the politics of that. He should have gone out there and, you know, patted himself on the back. He should have been out there, you know, I'm giving money to here. I'm giving, he never did any of that, which was completely bizarre. And I think it's because he's such a, such an unbelievably pathological troll. He just couldn't, he couldn't, he just like couldn't, he got so focused on his own, you know, score settling that he couldn't figure out how to make it good politics. But well, with Joe Biden, I think he like, COVID isn't real. So yeah, right. I can't I think take Biden, credit for the PPP. Can you imagine? I mean, and, and look, I think Biden's going to try to do this if, if this spending bill passes. They'll go out and sell it. And my point has been on this entire bill, the more direct aid you're getting out to people, the better a case you have to make in a midterm election that is going to be difficult anyway. Every big thing you cut out of that bill, 
you're making it harder for yourself to sell that bill. And the big danger is, here's the real danger, is that if you pass a bill that's cut out a lot of the stuff that directly, materially, immediately helps people, if you put in stuff that doesn't start the aid until you know five years from now or whatever, right? Or you know, the, I think the child tax credit, I think is only a one-year extension. It gets cut yeah. out. Then, then what you're doing is you're going out there and you're going to be saying, hey, look, look at all this great stuff we did. And, people, and a lot of people are going to be like, well, I hear you telling me it's a big victory, but I don't necessarily I gotta tell you, feel it. And that's we, that. Then it's like you're lying to me. We got we got to wrap it up. But I I, I got to tell you that it is my belief that nobody's going to be talking about any of this in the run up to the election, one way or the other. It's just I just don't. I just war. I, using I just culture war. Yes, I just don't think that. I just don't think that. Well, I I, don't, I agree I, with you. But and I know like what like what is the Republican complaint with this bill? No, no, I, I, I agree that it there, there is none. They haven't. It, they, they don't even care. They don't right. even care. It's gonna. I think I, if I had to bet right now, the election will be the Democrats saying we're going to defend Roe v. Wade, even of course though they're not actually taking action in the Congress to, to defend Roe v. Wade. It's a separate issue. They'll be saying Roe v. Wade. The Republicans will be doing culture war masks and the like. But my point is, is that if you actually delivered a really robust spending package, that. You could also be saying, look at us, look yes. at us. No, I agree. Yeah, I okay, agree. fine. You hear them arguing culture. My question is, has your life improved? Have we improved? Do you feel an improvement in your life because of what we did? And if the answer is yes, that only helps you. If the yeah, answer is I, no, I it doesn't help. I'm not, I'm not as convinced that this was really as much about the, 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 the electoral politics as much as it, as it was about the, the last opportunity to do some of these desperately needed reforms uh, for the country, but- Can I just uh, add David, one really well, quick, quick quick thing? My one really quick add is, this is an opportunity to turn politics into a politics that focuses on whether people are materially improving. I agree. And if you keep missing those opportunities, then then you get just get elections defined by culture war rather than you know economic issues that people are trying to survive on. I agree. Uh, David Sirota, folks, check out uh, The Daily Poster and- meltdown available at any podcast outlet that you may employ in any way thanks so much for joining us Dave. thank you sam really appreciate it all right folks we're gonna we're gonna do a freebie we're gonna do a freebie friday because we're already at two o'clock all right bitch, bastards bastards and i had meant to do like a shortened wednesday short shortened wednesday that doesn't that doesn't that's not didn't happen. That's, that doesn't roll off the tongue. No. Um, but, uh, what's that? The Widow Wednesday. Widow Wednesday. Yeah, it didn't work. Um, all right. Folks, just a reminder, it is your support that makes the show possible. When you become a member of the Majority Report, you, you not only support the free show, but you get uh, extra content. We uh, are no longer on Peacock in any fashion whatsoever i think they still are running repeats of, of reported although I, I, well, they're doing a literary hangover now for, for the life of me uh for the life of me i don't I, I i can't i can't i can't seem to access it i don't know there was a um there was a i don't know if anybody ever saw hill street blues there was this guy who, who was one of the cops on hill street blues and he ended up good directing he was like the southern guy on hill street blues and I walked into an audition with him one day and uh, he said, hey, Sam, I, I see you're with uh, William Morris. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I got, get, I got a good one for you. Uh, you want to commit the perfect crime? I'm like, yeah. Uh, how do I do that? He goes, rob a bank, sign with William Morris. They'll never find you. And on some level, it's the same thing on Peacock, it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, whatever. The point is... Um, the point is that um, your support is uh, needed to help this show survive and thrive. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Don't forget, live show, January 16th, ladies and gentlemen. Get your tickets now. Go to your podcast uh, uh, or your YouTube description. Go buy your tickets. We should probably put one on majority.fm. And if you yes. want also the AM Quickie, you'll find the link in the AM Quickie. Go to amquickie.com. Sign up for the uh, newsletter. Great. The newsletter is fantastic. We get such great feedback on the newsletter. It's yeah. kind of like an all newsletter uh, model. Uh, good point.
Yeah, you know. thanks, Emma. Yeah. Appreciate that. Uh, Matt, what's uh, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, we had Ben Burgess on, uh, oh. on Wednesday of Left Reckoning to go through his Charlie Kirk debate. Uh, and in the post game, we also went to Peter Thiel. Uh, coming up uh, this weekend, we have GP Jacob of the Money, Power, Land Solidarity podcast out of Minneapolis to talk about municipal, municipal elections uh, up in Minnesota. So uh, looking forward to discussing how um, basically after all went on last year, a environment of reaction uh, in these midterms, it looks, or in these municipal elections, it looks like. So check that out, uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning. Um, Matt, will you make sure that we put a uh, link in the YouTube description for the live show? Gotcha. All right, let's take a quick musical interlude uh, so that we can recharge for the, uh, for the second half of the freebie show on Friday. So do you want the uh, Dan here? Yeah, let's do that. People can see what happens with the Danark, and then we'll come back for the uh, for the uh, continuation of the free show. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Danarchy. Alpha males are back. Back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a whoa! Oh, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. Bring back DJ Danner. Yeah, yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like forty-five seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 matter <laughs> have you tried doing an impression on a college campus I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this psych and the alpha males are back 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 and the africans are black 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 african and the alpha males are black 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 and the africans are back 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 when you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are black, black. Africans are back, back. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Blast. Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy, 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 pussy. We are back. It is the continuation. Freebie Friday, ladies and gentlemen. Let's you get this out of the way, shall we? You remember Fred, your former president, uh, Barack Obama? Yes. Um, he has been spending his time building uh, houses with Habitat for Humanity. He has been uh, leading the charge to 
um, to provide uh, assistance. That, no, I'm, I'm all joking about no, that. No, he's no, had a that's, Netflix that's Jimmy deal. Jimmy Carter. That's Jimmy a Netflix Carter. deal, and he's made a ton of cash. And um, do you remember how desperately important the TPP was for our, our pivot to? <laughs> Well, that that thing, um, that thing probably was, you know, I think there was a dozen reasons why Hillary Clinton lost, but that certainly didn't help. Oh um, no, she was opposed to it. She said it in the primary, she was opposed to it, but uh, it I'm was, joking. She's... No, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know if she was or wasn't, but she certainly came out and said she was opposed to it. But I mean, the fact that she had to say she was opposed to it was a function of a uh, Barack Obama continuing to push it. Uh, in such a uh, a big way, I, I do Shouldn't... not believe she was opposed to it. <laughs> well, it should. I don't think it was ever going to pass. At that point, there was no way it was going to pass. As of, of February, he should have dropped it much earlier. Is my point. But be that as it may, there are a lot of other complaints I have with Barack Obama. But here he is. Um, I bring up 2016 only because he does. <laughs> here he is. Um, you know complaining about uh, the voters not being into stuff in the way that he wants them to. Uh, let's, let's listen to this. I, I, I know why sometimes folks just get tired and, and maybe they say, ah, you know, I'm not going to bother voting this time. But here's the thing. We can't afford to be tired. I remember in 2016, folks said, ah, you know, I'm not inspired. You know, I, I, Obama was okay, but we didn't get everything I wanted, so I'm just going to sit in next time. And, you know, y'all know pause how it, that turned it, out. Pause, pause it for one second. Pause it for one second. Now, now here's the thing, okay? Um, Obama's going to say nothing in this in this speech, but, but let's be clear. There are people at a rally. These people at the rally, they're voting. Uh, they're they're, they're going to vote. Yeah. The people he's trying to reach... Uh, I mean, this is this is really just so much more about like him mm -hmm. trying to reestablish the record in some way so that he is not responsible for anything, whatever. The point is, he's not helping, it seems to me, with with any of this, even on his own terms. The issue was that uh, you didn't get everything you wanted with Barack Obama. I don't think that was quite the thing. I think there was a lot of things that people needed that they didn't no. get. Don't you understand? Chil they're just like children, right? They didn't get the candy and the cookie. And so now you're going to sit out of the whole election because of that? Tisk tisk. Well, and think about who does get everything they want from a Obama administration, particularly the, the, during the financial crisis, et cetera. Like the, certain people got exactly what they wanted, and they also got exactly what they wanted out of this um, recent stuff with Biden. But even if, like, okay, like, here's the thing that I really find offensive about this. I think Barack Obama is absolutely right to say, like, you sat out 2016 election or whatever, you were disaffected, and look what happened. That part, I think, is um, is an important element to try and getting people to, out to vote. You saw how bad uh, Donald Trump was, and you didn't anticipate how bad things could get. But for that to be effective, he could say there were people who were dissatisfied after uh, my term. And I understand that dissatisfaction. And I may or may not agree with it, and I may have a different sense of it, but that satis dissatisfaction was real. But we found out how much worse it could be. That's, that's what Barack Obama says if what he is really concerned with is driving people out to vote. Every communications expert in the world will tell you that before you get to your ask, you better say, I understand what you're talking about. I am in the circle of trust. But he is alienating those people because he is trying to service his revision of history or whatever, his version of history. So just keep that in mind as you listen to him do this. He is, to the extent that he could be helpful, he is, he is, he is not being helpful because he's insisting insisting of litigating the way that people felt after his administration. Continue. But here's the thing. We can't afford to be tired. I remember in 2016, folks said, oh, you know, I'm not inspired. 
you know, I, I, Obama was okay, but we didn't get everything I wanted, so I'm just going to sit in next And, you know, y'all know how that turned out. That's what happens when you're not paying attention. That's what happens when you become complacent or you let your frustration lead to inaction. We cannot afford to be tired because of the young people here and the ones who are coming. I know it's hard. Phil doesn't claim he's going to solve every problem in New Jersey right away. I didn't solve every problem when I was president. But the fact is that as hard as it is, we can still make it better. It's hard to undo the legacy of discrimination that goes back centuries, but we can make it better. It's hard to deal with special interests who want to keep the status quo when you're trying to make the economy more fair and just, but you can make it better. It's hard in a big country where people disagree to get everybody moving in the same direction, but we can do better than we're doing. We really can. We can make it better. And when you've got the right person in the job, we might not get every single person employed, but we can get more people, more jobs. We may not get every child the best education in the world right here in Newark. We can give a lot more kids a better education here in Newark. I didn't get every American health care, but boy, we got a whole lot more people in America health care. It makes a difference when we decide to make things better. When you've got somebody in your corner who's shown you that they will work for you, who has a track record of accomplishment. You gotta go out there and work for them. Not because everything's gonna suddenly be perfect, but because it's gonna be better. And you're preventing others from making it worse. Yeah, I mean, he could have saved everybody a lot of time and just written that down in a diary or just like did that as a part of his pump up speech before he goes to work out in the morning. I mean, like, I. I the speech is for him and maybe for Hillary. I mean, what a contrast to his early rhetoric, too. Right. Hope and change, except actually, you know, voters weren't really paying attention. The, the, the reality is, is that a lot of voters were paying attention. You can say it's wrong to get disaffected, but they were wrong. They, they, just because you can say it's wrong to be disaffected and still not vote because look at how bad things are. I don't think that's particularly inspirational, but the reality is, is that people were disaffected and disenchanted for a reason. And it's not helpful to chide and chastise, except for, you know, if you want to, again, work backwards from, from, from your own narcissism. It's better. Trust me. Look closer. Here's a microscope. Look, if you look really close to this little part here, we did it better. Uh, I, I, at one point he said like, you know, we, we can do, we can do uh, better than, you know, getting everybody in the same direction as we are now we can do better than we can do. And then he had to realize like, wait a second. No, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing in favor of incumbents. Uh, no, 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 uh, we, I mean, just better, 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 better. Um, I think like, I just think that there was a lot of people who were disillusioned with Obama's sort of rhetoric and had projected onto that rhetoric um, tangible things. And I, I, I guess my patience for his sort of, you know, g general rhetoric, uh, better, you know, make it better, more, you know, somewhat more marginally better. Um, it, it just... He he's gonna have to do a little better than that. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But again, like it's it, it's exactly yeah. what we were talking about with uh, or what I mentioned with uh, one of the Davids. I'm forgetting which one about like this ivory tower sensibility here. I mean, the the Obama does not see himself or like the consequences of what the Democratic Party does as I think directly correlated to the response of voters he thinks it's like all part of you know politics as cajoling people or manipulating them in a certain way um and it's 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 like anti-populism and not right-wing populism of course but it's just it's i mean i i i hesitate to use the term elitist but that's a lot of what it is um I, yeah. 
All right, let's have a, a little palate cleanser, shall we? Mm -hmm. um, you remember that Ben Shapiro very famously said that there was no problem with rising sea levels, uh, particularly for the homeowners who lived there because they could just sell their homes to yes. other people. To other sell people. their underwater home and the market will be excellent but but emma that's <laughs> you're missing the point you sell it before it gets underwater you know it's going to be underwater so you sell it before it gets underwater to some sucker who doesn't know that it's going to be underwater and then the homeowners are fine is that what Except, we're of course the just people who are then the homeowners they're just trying to save a market for like a, a, just a dumb population of people who don't know climate change is coming so they can sell their but, beachfront property. But even if like, what's amazing about that comment is he's only talking about how the people who own the property now or today, as opposed to tomorrow are the homeowners, right? Yeah. Like, like, like it's, it's like, a, Oh, I thought you meant Jim and, and, and Betty, and Steve and Dan, they have houses on the coast. And once they sell, then we don't have to worry about people who have a house on the coast because there'll be different people in there that we don't know. Like, and they are not homeowners. <laughs> or the, no, they're the because no, it's like it's Ayn Randian. They are the sucker homeowners, exactly. and 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 sucks they for you. They deserve it. They right. deserve it. Because they made a bad investment, which is somebody, why they should get bailed out by the federal government. I don't if know. somebody knows that. If there's one person who knows that they should sell, then everybody should know that they shouldn't buy. But here's Ben, uh, ben Shapiro uh, talking more about global warming um, on the Ben Shapiro show. Here is the thing, gang. Most global warming is already <laughs> baked into the cake. The reality is that any measure that, that dramatically harms the global economy on behalf of lowering carbon emissions is a fool's errand. You are much better off taking some of that potential gain and using it on mitigation efforts and adaptation efforts rather than attempting to completely remake the world economy to stop carbon emissions altogether, considering a huge percentage of the world's population still lives in abject poverty, burning dung for fuel. Carbon emissions are not the, the specific problem in the long run. The specific problem is how human beings deal with carbon emissions. The earth is not going to boil. Not all human life is going to die. All the catastrophic nonsense about how billions of people are going to be living in, in, in basically a Mad Max universe if global warming continues. It's silly. It's not true. Technology has improved. The United States, for example, our emissions have leveled off. China's are not going to level off. China's going to continue to emit at high rates. Developing countries are going to continue to emit at high rates. And by the way, if you wanted them to stop emitting at those high rates, you'd have to pay them trillions of dollars. They are openly saying this now. So your choice, do you wish to sink the growth of the world economy, which, by the way, is what allows people to live longer. It allows people to be healthy. It allows people to care about the environment, because I'll tell you what you don't care about when you are Wrong. living in abject poverty, burning dung for fuel, global warming. That's not something that's on the top one million of your of your issues. Okay, but for the very rich among us, these are the top issues. The top issues are great systems. How can we impact the great systems of climate by also taking control of the great systems of economics? A, a, a civilization whose primary worry is whether there is going to be global warming over the course of the next 100 years that causes some people to move from their homes and causes, if the estimates are correct and the economy continues to grow as it has done for the past century and a half, yeah. it will cause a few thousand deaths over the course of a century. What? I really, this is according to the estimates from Bjorn Lomberg over at the Copenhagen Institute. Oh, Bjorn. And the notion that hundreds of thousands or millions of people <laughs> are going to die from, from global warming is just based on the fact that human beings adapt to their environment and adapt to the climate. That's not true. The notion that you're going to sink the world economy on that basis, it, that, that, is a, um, that is a rich people thing. Wait, wait, wait. This guy, I mean, aside from his, the, the climate denialist that, uh, who's off, obviously off his climate denial now, but this is, this is just, what's awesome is that he starts off by conceding that climate change is real. It's just that it's not really real. Uh, mm -hmm. by the end, right? It's really not going to impact a couple of thousand people. It's, not it's already, it's, it's already can mitigate. Yeah, tens yeah. of thousands of people. You are um, derangement syndrome. It's not even going to be that bad. I mean, I don't know if I believe some estimates that we could lose 80% of the world's population within a hundred years. I think that 
That seems extreme to me, but we're going to lose a lot of op uh, places where uh, food can grow. <laughs> And we're going to have, we've already had trillions upon trillions of dollars of, of damages that um, at least we know, statistically speaking, some portion of that is attributable to climate change. We will, uh, there is in fact in the Build Back Better bill, one fifth of the money for climate change is to begin to, uh, do things like adapt and to deal with the harm as opposed to trying to slow the harm. But the idea that it's so backwards, the idea that if we were all just burning dung, we wouldn't be in this situation, frankly. Uh, the idea that we have to destroy the uh, world economy um, is also untrue, A, but B, what do you what does he think is going to happen to the world economy why does he think that the u.s military is looking upon this as the number one national security threat it is because it is going to destabilize the entire our entire civilization in some fashion it's not gonna yeah they, they think that they're worried about the supply chains now i mean um, once there are mass uh catastrophic climate events they're, they'll find a new Buttigieg or a new uh, Democrat to blame it on, but it's going to be the result of the climate emergency. It really is uh, stunning um, that the to what to track the evolution of 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 where they've been on climate change. And also, now it's all baked in. I went, like, where, where's this guy been? Well, yeah, no, what? It's, it came from climate denial to, uh, yeah, it may be happening, but it's not uh, being caused by human beings to now it is maybe being caused by human beings, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, and so, like, they, they never acknowledged the fact that they were wrong in increments in the five years before. And when he talked about people burning dung for fuel, I mean, obviously, that reminded me of his uh, his racist comments about Palestinians that went viral at that time. I mean, he the, like the way that Ben Shapiro views the non wealthy world or the non Western world is so inherently racist. And so he's basically saying people burning dung for fuel, they, they would not be the, be the ones that would bear the brunt of climate change. They would they actually be elevated if the the uh, if capitalism and global economic growth because it's growing now i mean i don't know how that dovetails with his biden critique but regardless um it would finally reach their shores and they would no longer be burning dung for fuel um pretty sure dude that the reason that there are is mass poverty in nations across the globe is because of capitalism because capitalism as constructed was built on colonial exploitation and that those groups in the world are not benefiting from global capitalism because of that very structure in fact they are going to be the ones the hundreds of thousands that he discounts that are dying and then they'll be invisible to people like ben shapiro in the decades to come because it doesn't matter to him he's fine with sacrificing them for the global growth of the economy but he can't say that and then did you catch this also weird part where he's like He's saying that this is all like a rich people argument. Is he trying to like do some type of like right wing populism well, now? Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's trying to gilet jean, <laughs> or right wing uh, capture these gilet jean things. He's trying to push this in. The people who are looking to destroy the economy are the people who are benefiting it from the most as okay. it is developed now. I mean, I don't even understand like what he's trying to. That's a Tucker Carlson thing. That's like I, a way exactly. to use leftist language with like actual right wing ideology. Exactly. It's the same thing with that, you know, Peter his, Thiel candidate that was elevated the other day, who was using uh, his clicks must be go, must be uh, must be dropping because he yeah, feels but, like he's got to push that or something, or maybe maybe he's going to what is it that guy Masters, is that Grant it is? The, Masters, the Blake. COO of uh, of of Teal Holdings or whatever Blake. it is. No, yeah. he was doing the same thing. It's it's eco fascism. That's the next. That's the next. Um, that's the next like uh, manifestation of this, um, which is Sam. We I don't even think we told you we had a uh, another anti-reproductive caller, a much more reasonable. Uh, uh, yes, she called in yesterday and just thought we were a little unfair. Um, 
but uh but apparently <laughs> I, I mean that's I, a movement i am sympathetic with the idea that um you don't want children they're just all they constant, personally go ahead constant 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 just texting uh, allowance question mark stuff like that you don't want that believe me or uh yeah i mean that's all your time your text with your kids are just allowance question mark that's basically all i get from mila now it's oh, yeah. allowance question mark money for me um I just want to, I have a final point on this. Um, what's interesting to me about this is Ben Shapiro is actually responding to policy right now. When he said, that, first of all, we all know this whole China and developing countries are going to keep uh, emitting. Again, this is another ahistorical right wing argument because we're not going to tot up all of the uh, um, historical emissions by the West. Um, it just starts now and um, we all have to stop at the same time, right? But it gets to a, a larger point that I talked to with the La Ruta del Clima uh, folks on Left Reckoning, which is like, Shapiro is now accepting two of the part three parts of uh, climate policy, which is adaptation and mitigation. And that's great. I'm glad, Ben, you've joined us on this stuff. It'd be nice if we started adapting and mitigating maybe 15, 20 years ago, maybe even more than that. But there's a third part, loss. What do you do for countries that cannot actually mitigate or adapt to these problems that have been caused by these massive economic powers? And you have to pay them cash. You have to give them money. And that's what Ben Shapiro, when he says that, now they're starting to even ask about, right, they want trillions of dollars to do that. It's because they need it. It's because like the way that our system is set up, we're not going to be able to get off of this without it. And it's in, in some respects, it's reparations. Exactly. That's exactly. Right? I mean, um, all right, let's uh, turn to this, uh, this clip of uh, Lauren Windsor from the undercurrent with John oh, Eastman. Yeah. This is interesting oh. because- She's on a tear. <laughs> she's on a tear. And um, this is going to become- I think th these type of things are going to become more and more relevant. We're going to hear more and more about like, you know, uh, exactly how January 6th went, went down. I think that there is, um, it shouldn't, I, as far as I'm concerned, none of this should be taking as long as it's taking, but uh, you know, I guess there's been other things that the, the, the house has had to do. I am for one am uh, think that there should be a whole host of investigations about the Trump administration. I think that's a healthy thing for our, um, our government and for our society. Um, but this guy, John Eastman, this Federalist Society, longtime Republican lawyer who wrote the basically the game plan on how you could overthrow the vote, uh, that Donald Trump could overthrow the vote. He had previously said when the memo became public in the National Review online, right? I think it was he it was interviewed. He said that the, the memo was not even viable. It, it would have been crazy to pursue but I, you know, as a lawyer, I generate these things and uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm giving options to my clients and yeah, no, that, no way. It wasn't even supposed to be, it was like, you know, it's like a fun, fun memo, a fun memo. What if we did this? You know, like I say to Matt, like, uh, what if we, what if we put all this, the whole thing on the road and we just did it in a uh, trailer? Ah, okay. Whatever. It was a brainstorm sesh. And it was the a brainstorm. National yeah, Review gave a pride spitball. of place. Spitball. Spitball. Yeah, National Review gave a pride of place in the nothing to see here uh, column. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's spitballing. Well, um, I guess John Eastman didn't really want people to read that because um, when he had the opportunity to actually talk not on the public record uh, with uh, Lauren Windsor, who was, um, I guess, uh, portraying herself as a fan, he had something quite different to say. Did I incite you to go down to the Capitol and riot? You actually incited us to become supporters of Claremont. Oh, good. Very yeah. good. Very good. Because, you know, and the work that you're doing is just so critical to saving our democracy. Thank and it's like, we couldn't not support your work after that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's very yeah. kind of you. So thank you. You're, you're really doing the Lord's work. Well, and I, you know, uh, that's my old, uh, you heard me say it. My old professor said, if you're not catching incoming flack, you're not over the target. And my God, I must be directly over it. Cause yeah. It, I don't think there's anybody catch as much incoming flack, maybe than other than Trump himself, that I have over the last six months. I mean, it's amazing. Well, but I read your memo and I thought it was solid in all of its legal arguments. Yeah. And I just, I was floored that that Mike Pence didn't do anything. I mean, why didn't he act on it? Because you gave him the legal reasoning to do that. I know, I know. Now it's and now in a, in a piece in the Atlantic two days ago. 
they're already anticipating Trump winning in 2024, and they're using my arguments from that memo that they all said had no credibility to argue that Kamala Harris can block Trump's electoral votes. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, I mean, come on, people, you can't. So basically, everyone's going to say, you're being proven right. Yeah, exactly, exactly, except they're not saying that, right? <laughs> but that's what they mean. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. all of your legal reasoning is totally solid. Yeah, yeah, it, there's no question, but. Uh, but I mean, like, you know, just supporter to supporter, like, why do you think that Mike Pence didn't do it? Well, because Mike Pence is an establishment guy at the end of the day, and the establishment Republicans in D.C. bought into this very myopic view that Trump was destroying the Republican Party. And what Trump was doing is destroying the inside the Beltway Republican Party and reviving the Republican Party in the hinterland, right? What they all consider to be, you know, deplorable flyover country. And this uprising that Trump got ahead of, he, he didn't create the movement. The movement was there, yeah. and he saw it and got ahead of it. Um, but no, that's, they can't tolerate that because they all they all have nice, cushy livings inside the Beltway. I love the fact that he's saying all this at the Claremont Institute Gala. Yeah, I mean, she is so good at getting him to, like, flattering him up or buttering him up and then allowing him to really speak his mind. Oh, I'm, I'm really talking to a true believer here. What he uh, sim seems to still think his uh, legal reasoning was sound that the only reason why he didn't do it was because there were people who didn't like Trump. And uh, it wasn't so much that the the memo was not viable or that it would have been crazy to follow it, but just like they, uh, <laughs> they, they, they must be going to a rival gala at that moment. I wonder if we can expect a follow-up from uh, Rich Lowry in the uh, National Review. Yeah, one would expect, like, oh, we uh, printed this stuff in the nothing to see here. Apparently, something to see here. Yes. Um, I also do appreciate that, like, you, when you look back on the Trump administration and all the different lackeys that peppered that uh, that that group, Every single one of them gets thrown under the bus. It doesn't matter. It literally does not matter who you are. I mean, Mike Pence was at Trump's feet completely. Giuliani is another example of somebody who is a true, true supporter through and through. And you read these like articles about how Mike Pence believed that Trump and serving him subserviently, like as a as a beta, that was a part of his religious calling and. It doesn't matter as like if he if you don't go lockstep uh, with him, the the whole Trump apparatus turns on you. It's it's like a it's very lots of Schadenfreude there for me at least. Yes, it is really um, it's satisfying to see without a doubt. All right, lastly, let's play this clip and then we'll do some IMs and then we'll wrap things up. Um, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, right? Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook announced the new name of Facebook. It is now known as Meta. <laughs> what a, what a, what a, like a, just, I don't have any music for it. I thought you were looking for a soundboard. I was looking for something. I'm like, there's nothing. Yeah. Just wow, like, Matt, that was from your, from your mouth. That was pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, Meta, here it is. The so-called progressives are actually regressing. There you go. Whatever. That's oh, yeah. Right. Uh, it's meta now. And I will tell you this. Um, <laughs> I think that's a horrible name. I don't think that people. Well, you got to say it like it's meta, man. Well, what's Google? Is it an alphabet now? Like they. <laughs> well, Alphabet's like the holding company, right? But like they actually, are you going to log on? I'm, first of all, I, I should say, I, I, I. I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook. I don't, I don't even have a personal account really. Um, or to the extent that I do, I have never been able to access it, but, uh, okay. Boomer. If you, what boomers are big on, on Facebook. So, but honestly, like, are you going to log in and it's going to say meta or is it Facebook going to be like the app and meta is the company or something? Yeah. Sort? I'll let you know in three months, the next time I log into Facebook. <laughs> okay. Well, but, uh, the good news is, we're not going to have to live in this world anymore. We're going to be able to live in the new metaverse. Oh man. Check it out. This is so cool. I'll tell you something. Honestly, like 
Well, the worst part it's about this. It's a Black this, Mirror episode. The, the worst part is. about it is the anti gravity because um, you'll see there are people floating in the metaverse, which means that it's impossible to jump off the ledge of a building, which is exactly <laughs> what I would want to do in this situation. So let's start by exploring what different kinds of metaverse experiences could feel like, starting with the most important experience of all connecting with people. Uh. <laughs> oh, that looks super con connected. I feel the warmth from here. Imagine you put on your glasses or headset and you're instantly in your home space. It has parts of your physical home recreated virtually. It has things that are only possible virtually. And it has an incredibly inspiring view of whatever you find most beautiful. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. Comedy. All right, perfect. Hey, oh, hey, Mark. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Hi, Mark. Mark. What's up, Mark? Whoa, we're floating in space? <laughs> Why do they insist on putting this man front and center? Like, if you want to say, oh, this will help you connect with people. They're going to put their CEO who's never connected with a human being in his life at the very front. Like when I think about somebody who I'm able to have a conversation with, I do Who's not think say about no Mark Zuckerberg. Who's yeah. going to say no to him? I know. You know how it is around our office. Nobody <laughs> says no to me when I'm like, hey, well, uh, today, no color. Nobody even said a word. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, like we do rip on you uh, quite a bit, but uh, when I'm not there, when I'm not there, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's what the cameras, that's what the audio, the cameras and the the audio uh, stuff is for. Excuse me? No, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, keep playing it. Let's see. I want to see this uh, meeting because this I is going to be the new one. you got unless I can find more of it. But uh... Oh, oh they, they go into the meeting and that the meeting is just like, there are people playing cards and like, oh, hey, hey, hey Mark's fun. here. And we're all like, yeah. honestly, like I just, you just want like, oh. God. I want the visual impression of me being weightless, but actually to be able to feel myself still weighted to the ground. That sounds super fun. <laughs> it sounds dizzying and disorienting. Oh, and, oh I God. mean, and then there's like this, uh, there was an interview about this new effort and Zuckerberg said something like, imagine how amazing it would be if you use, if you use these virtual glasses that I provide for you and you'll be able to text without even the person you're talking to in real life knowing through your glasses. Like, so essentially you're wiring an entire population to just constantly be connected to your product. And you're pretending like this is some sort of revelatory experience when it's just enriching you. Like it's actually making us demented and changing people's brain chemistry. And it's like, it's freaky. You want people to, be in this metaverse non-physical world while they're physically interacting with other people I, I mean are you trying to give everybody personality disorders maybe if it makes you money it's just it's it's yeah. it's really gross and scary to me i think he's just looking to whatever is going to make him money that's no i get it ideas. like what's the last thing that facebook has come out with that actually like i i mean it's hard to even think of the first thing frankly because it's just a, a nicer interface for myspace but like what what has this company ever innovated but they have to they're selling it and it's honestly being picked up by like the type of crypto knuckleheads that are excited by any sort of promise of technology and like this is going to be revolutionary and the people that don't see it now you're just philistines all right, let's go to the IMs. Little Mac, cheerleading a shit bill will end all the energy behind progressive candidates and lead to long-term progressive weakness, which is exactly what the establishment wants. And guilting progressives into taking garbage is better than nothing. Um, love this caller. If DNC is not listening to him, I don't know who the caller is. The inflation we're experiencing is from the rich buying up all the San Francisco homes and property. So the inflation is just exasperating a rising home cost issue that does not seem to most people. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, Zephi, uh, make sure to remind all MR listeners that Tuesday is an election day. Pennsylvania, we have a hugely important statewide elections. Pittsburgh's first black mayor, Ed Ganey, is on the ballot, and there are a bunch of co a court of common uh, pleas seat, uh, seats up in Allegheny County. Following a good primary, there's a good chance to make big change this November. Folks, big election, Tuesday, election day. Go out and vote. 
Clever leftist meme. I've been following since the Crowder H3 interaction, and I just became a member. Shout out to the H3 podcast. Thank you. That's awesome. Oh, okay. I used to listen to Pod Save America a lot, but after following you guys, I can barely handle them anymore. Excellent. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> wanted, wanted some advice on where to start reading for a novice who wants to learn more about Marx and other leftist thinkers. Matt, what would you recommend? Uh, I think Eric's, Eric Hobsbawm's got a book, How to Change the World. That's sort of a history of the idea of Marxism and how it's played out across the world. That's a great one. Left-handed stranger. How crazy would it be, as it, impossible as it is, if Charlie Kirk ended up moving over after all these debates he will probably have on his debate show? Just check out Vouch versus Charlie Kirk too someday. It was really interesting. Yeah, I got to check these out actually. Digital Jabal. Hello, hello. Longtime listener, member, and analog fellow who finally got on the app. Love all of you. My question is for Emma. Am I delusional thinking that the Giants could beat KC? I don't think you're delusional um, because I think that Kansas City, there's something broken right now. Um, and if you just, they're just putting two deep safeties back and and like with I don't know and also Mahomes is playing badly it's 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 odd to see it seems like he's scarred from his offensive line last year and he's just always looking for the big play but I think they're going to be motivated after that terrible loss to Tennessee I don't think the Giants can win I think they can cover if you're betting especially if Kadarius Tony plays and I think it's a longer shot for Kenny Galladay but um anyway that's that's my advice maybe bet the uh bet the Giants to cover but not to win Chantel, Sam, you are so naive when it comes when you say Nancy Pelosi failed their own standards. They overachieved. They gave us a good circus show. Nothing fundamentally changed like Biden wanted. If you still say it's a conspiracy theory to say they wanted it to fail, I am sorry to see your naivetivity. Uh, That's they are not veterans. a word. <laughs> Naivety. Oh. Na 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 naivety? I don't know. I, uh, not, I, I can't I'm keep kidding. having this debate again. I mean, this is not Could right. be naivete. Um, oh, no, you're not talking about the debate over naiveness. Oh, wait, what's the I am or saying they want it to fail as in there's no bill? They're veterans. Do you think they don't know how to pass a bill if they want to? This per, I mean, is this person predicting they're not going to pass anything? Like, you, you can't I, say you're right about everything when you're uh, ambiguous about what you're saying happened. Are you saying that they, of course, Nancy Pelosi was always going to kill any kind of major bill they or always wanted a 1.75 trillion dollar bill nobody's disagree well i like i've said before like when they when jen saga came out and said well mansion cinema still want a bill and you know chuck schumer kept the thing out like but we agree with this we agree that they wanted allowed it to be watered down but we just don't agree that it's on purpose and we don't agree that like they're intentionally sabotaging it and they're paid opposition or whatever i mean i think they they are less committed to specific policy positions in the bill than getting a bill passed to have a win happen if you want to make it have a conversation about like how the democratic party is not committed to principles i agree i just don't think it's intentional sabotage and this is well, what the grand plan was all along but i mean i got there's an intent to intentionality behind this stuff always getting watered down for corporate interests but like i don't think we deny that <laughs> Yeah, I I, 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 I just think that like if they wanted to get here in a way that was going to maintain their power, there was other ways for them to get here. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Vinny Holiday, they may not all be Nazis, but they're gearing up for violence. So many QAnoners were Obama voters. I feel like this is the last presidency had a chance to truly unify the country. Now we're on a very dangerous path. So many QAnoners were Obama voters. I wonder about that. Yeah, I don't. Flair know. Child. Is it a coincidence that the day one agenda is DOA? Nice. Marmix. Milo Yiannopoulos is showing up at my school next week to give a talk about how cool gay conversion therapy is. My school isn't doing anything to stop it. So I guess uh, keep an eye on the news from that. Uh, laugh my ass off. Send us any video. Send us any video. Illuminati kids. This Friday show is a wild roller coaster ride. I feel like I'm being talked to. Opposite sides of the ledge, <laughs> moment to moment, indeed. Bear at home, too. Uh, after hearing David Dayan's explanation of the bill, do new Matt and Emma still think the bill should be tanked? 
I, I've said that the one thing that I don't think they should do is vote for it and then act like it was some sort of success. If they vote for it and like, say you need to take the pre-K and the uh, pro act provision stuff. Um, but fundamentally there needs to be some signal of a split here because you're going to blow your credibility in any kind of campaigning. Sink Mansion's yacht. Right, David. I think he's talking to Sirota at 154. Everyone should shut up and stay in their lane unless they went to Northwestern. What? I'm not sure I totally follow that, but chicken salad restaurant. That call on Wednesday from the guy who thought the government should disincentivize people from having kids was the hardest I've laughed in a long time. It's obvious that this clown's idea of tax incentives does not go far enough. We need to give the death penalty to people and animals for having kids. The babies will get their parents' house and feed on the meat of the dead animal parents. Win-win. All right. The Tim Caucus. Doing a panel show with the two Davids would have been fun. That's true. Happy Ivna. Honest question, Sam. You generally seem swayed by the notion that you start big with your first bid, yes, knowing that it will be whittled down. Correct. How do you square that with day and seeming suggestion that we should have started smaller? I don't think that he was suggesting we start smaller. I think what he was saying is have a list of priorities that you have a fallback if you see this process of whittling down so you know where your red lines are. Um, and I think the idea would be also to sort of like having pre-established the notion that we should have we should do a small number of things right, ultimately, uh, if this thing was going to shrink, rather than keeping all the different things in it. So I don't think he was talking about a, like a top line number as much as he was talking about um, a, a, an approach to governing. I think if we're talking about the same thing, Cinema Toast, ah, oh, love the point about losing social programs and being People being attracted to hard right radical ideas, getting rid of student loan debt is the administration's last best hope. Um, train boy, I've got great news. I got the results from my CATS uh, CT scan back and I'm officially in remission. Can't wait to see you all in Boston this January. That is so awesome. That's awesome for you. So great. Very, very happy to hear that. Sam's free. I don't know how I feel about your actions since you've stopped being a corporate lackey for Peacock. First, the attempted short Wednesday, then the no collared shirt. Where does it end? Next thing you know, you'll be getting your face tattooed and calling yourself Little Seat. <laughs> Talking about nothing but sports. Dutch boy, can we get a moderate right senator or two who aren't planning on running again and secret until the vote to vote for the reconciliation bill? No. Rob from Dedham. Hey, MR crew. Happy Friday. Great show as always. Turning 30 today. Can I get a show far? Happy birthday. All down here from here, kid. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Wake and Joe. Nice neck, bro. Metaverse is named after a dystopian social network from the cyberpunk novel Snow Crash. Great impression book. 100% why he wanted to pitch it himself. Uh, new Mr. Fan. I've been watching for a few months. You guys make me smarter and mad, but I still watch. Sam, Emma, and crew, thank you. Thank you. Chris Burdick, you only bring on David Dane as a guest so that Emma will know what it's like to do a show with two Sam Cedars. She hasn't already experienced that in a series of reoccurring nightmares. All right, we'll do, we'll do four more. Cudlow's, uh, Cudlow's Trojan Slope. Uh, Pelosi's press conference looks more and more like a life alert ad. We're going to get her frame. <laughs> I'm not getting up at this rate. <laughs> Josh from Connecticut. Missed the show yesterday. Why did you guys touch on the Chicago Blackhawk situation? Or did you guys touch on the no. Chicago? No, we did not touch on it. Um, I'm sorry. I, like, I did. We could talk on about it another time. It's insane. It's horrible. The NHL should be ashamed of itself. And I watched that whole interview um, with Kyle Beach. I would encourage everybody to. Jay Shiva 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 Jay Shiva. Why can't a millionaire get a better wig? There you go. Multi-millionaire get a better wig. There you go. I probably uh probably the uh, Zuckerberg. Indeed. 
Benito, hello from Europe. I got bad news. I was diagnosed with golfer's elbow, and the worst is that I don't even play golf. Never had. Have a good weekend to, uh, to all in MR. I think I have that too in my left hand. I've got some problem where I've got a nerve pinch here, and uh, my three fingers are numb for the past like three weeks. Ugh. I'm yep. sorry that hasn't gone away. Well, I mean, I'm going to go see a doctor eventually. Uh, Oliver Wendell, home slice, LBJ would have seized the patents and planted a dead hooker on Mansions Yacht three months ago. <laughs> Step up your game, Dems. Indeed, right? And the final I am of the entire week, ladies and gentlemen. Congressional baseball fan. Sam, I really respect you, and nobody else is willing to stand up to all the fake fanatics. But when are we going to start using these baseballs? And I'm talking about <laughs> playing baseball. How many stolen bases are we going to tolerate here? You feel me? <laughs> Matt, Bradley and Abstentia, Emma, great job this week. Folks, see you on Monday. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot Choices made for the option where you don't get paid.